G'day, g'day. We've got Mezgobler Scrap Boss here. The first model by Mezgeik Miniatures that I sculpted for you to download and print so that we can paint together. Hell yeah. Go and get him from Mezgeik.com. Righto, we got 14 parts in this kit. 14 pre-supported parts. Go and hook them on the printer and turn this into a physical miniature so that we can start carefully cutting out the supports with our clippers. Or, you know, we could actually bloody just rip the parts out with our bare hands because that works quite well too. Check out his big axe. That's called the Zapper Axe because of all the lightning on it. That lightning is quite delicate so we want to be very careful when we're clipping out the supports around it. We should start with the supports on the lightning first just so we don't snap the lightning off. And of course, if you aren't mad like me and you don't want to paint lightning, just cut the lightning off. Problem solved. But if you do want to paint the lightning and you cut it out properly, it should look like this with four bits of lightning on it. See this little pipe here? That's not a support, that's a pipe, so don't cut that out. Yeah, so we've got a little front here with a 50 cal. We've got 14 parts that we've got to cut out. That includes four head options, and two of them have hats, and I reckon that might make them even a little bit more of a boss. What do you think? Let's choose our favorite head for this model. For this video, I'm just going to go with this one because I love his scar, and he's got a bung eye just like me. Now let's grab a shiv so we can start cleaning the points where the supports meet the model. They leave these little dots, these little nubs, almost like little nipples, and we need to scrape them clean so that the parts are nice and smooth and they fit together nicely. Now these are basically the 3D miniature version of a mold line. Except they're not quite as annoying to clean off as a mold line in my opinion. See these parts here? Well on my print, the holes got a little bit clogged with some gunk. So we're just going to use a 2mm drill bit and widen those holes out. If that happens to you, that's all you've got to do. Just widen the holes a little bit so that she fits nice and snug like this. Check out my rat sandpaper. I call this rat sandpaper because it's the same piece of sandpaper I've used for 12 years and it's almost become like a pet rat and I'm sort of fond of it and I can't let it go. Let's use a half mil drill bit to put some holes in some parts. We're going to mount this to wire, all these parts here. Check this out. Gorilla Super Glue. This is the super glue that you'll want to put on your shopping list next time you head down to the shops. This stuff is like jelly. So unlike every other super glue which is really runny and just pisses out of your this stuff just doesn't because it's jelly and it just stays where you put it. It's genius. Let's get some PVA glue onto that base. Spread it around with a bit of a brush. And then we're going to get some sort of gritty stuff and apply it to that PVA glue. I'm using baking soda but I'm not going to use it again because it goes really crazy with the uh, PVA glue. I've had some good results with it and sometimes it just reacts weird. Today it's reacting weird and it's kind of like going into some sort of science experiment. So I'd use dirt next time. Make sure you keep your rims clean too. We're going to grab our part, our main body part and press it down in the base and stamp his foot so that it makes a bit of a footprint. We're going to know where to put him now, aren't we? We'll let that base dry, but before it does, let's get some clean water and just wash off the bottom of his foot so that PVA glue doesn't stick to his feet. Then we're going to grab our Gorilla Super Glue and put four dots on each side of the torso where the arms go. Now grab his left arm and get it on there. Get it on there, it's only going to take three seconds. That's all it takes, three seconds to grab. It's good stuff, this Gorilla Super Glue. Now get his other arm on there, get it on there, good. Three seconds, and then we're on our way. Now, it's basically a walk-in can of tuna at the moment. So he needs his lid on. So we're just going to put that on. That's the one with the horns. Let's call it the lid to his super suit. And it is a super suit, bloody super. Get his head on there as well. How go with this pile of stuff? we got some wood. We've got some wire, and now we've got some blocks of wood with wire sticking out. Let's get some of our Gorilla Super Glue onto the ends of those wires so that we can take our parts that we pre-drilled earlier and just slide them onto the wire. This is going to make it a lot easier when we're spray painting later. 
For the base, we're just going to stick it onto a miniatures holder with some kind of blue tack or something, so that we can rotate around like that. There's all our parts ready for spray painting. Well, almost ready. We've got to do a couple more things. Plastic putty. You could use green stuff if you want. We just have a few tiny little gaps to fill. When I say a few, I mean this one and that one, and that's it. I'm doing this bit here on his neck, but I can tell you, having finished the miniature, no point, no point. You won't even see that. Let's get a bit of water onto it, and we can feather this out, make it a little bit smoother. And once it's dry, we can get some sandpaper on it, smooth it out, or rough it up. Rough it out, then smooth it out. Get our rat sandpaper and smooth it even more. It's fascinating stuff. Let's get some more PVA glue and put it onto the lid of some kind of container that belongs to your wife. Mix some water with it into a bit of a, a runny type consistency and then just start painting it over the rough parts of the base. And then we can sprinkle some dirt on it. And when I say dirt, I mean I went into the garden with my sandwich and got some dirt and filled a box with it. I came back inside and I sprinkled that dirt all over my base. I've got some rocks on there too. And once that dries, we'll get back to our PVA glue wash and paint over all of the rocks and the sand and the dirt just to seal it up. This is special. I made these little spent ammo cases for you guys. Go and print them out. Print as many as you want. Add some dollops of Gorilla Super Glue around the place. Get your tweezers and just place some spent ammo cases. Like I said, have fun with it. Fill the whole bloody base with ammo cases if you want. Let's prime our parts. We're going to use Chaos Black Spray Paint. You could use any color, it doesn't matter. But I'm using black. And when you prime your parts, keep the can about 30-40 centimeters away from the parts and just do short little bursts from left to right or up and down. Don't be going silly with it and just holding the trigger down, melting everything in sight with it, okay? We want a very light, speckled finish. You can see how having the parts mounted to a bit of wire or a miniatures holder makes it a lot easier to get all those hard to reach angles. Like you're gonna have a hard time shooting Mezgob in the balls with his spray paint if he's stuck to a base or something. So I'm always wanting to 80% prime, like 80% coverage. That's what we want. Not We're not laying concrete slabs on these parts, okay? You want a very light speckled finish so that the paint can grab onto it. Well, we've made it through the most boring part. Now we're up to part two, base coat the elements. We're gonna use Abaddon Black and we're gonna thin it down with a little bit of water. Have a go at the consistency, pretty runny. And just start slapping it everywhere, get it on everything in sight. Watch the spatter as you get excited about it. It starts flicking everywhere sometimes, be careful. Out of nowhere, we're just going to be using some Steel Legion Drab now. We're going to base coat the pants. We really are base coating all the elements now. Of course, we always want to thin it down with water. We might have even used a little bit too much water on the pants, but look how worried I am about it. I'm not worried, because we'll just do another coat. Now, let's get, get his fur up here under his shoulders, his fur coat. We've got some strapping here on the exhaust on his engine, as well as this little runt's pants. Now here's the colors that we're gonna use for the skin base color. Niles Green and Dark Rust. If you haven't got Niles Green, here's a substitute for you. Wild Flesh with a tiny little bit of Moot Green mixed into it. You could probably even just use Wild Flesh by itself. Why not? But today, we're mixing three parts Niles Green to two parts Vallejo Dark Rust. Or thereabouts. It's not an exact science. Just make it look sort of like this. But you really want that brown to shine through. That dark rust is a powerful color. And we want that shining through. We don't want a bright green. We want a, a muted, dark, dirty green. Look at that beautiful, dirty orc skin green. That's what I'm talking about. From now on, we're going to call this Mezgob Skin Base. All right. Now, when you're base coating the skin, I like to keep paint away from the eye sockets and the eyeballs. What's the point in just clogging up that detail and making it 
harder for us later on when we need to actually paint the eyeballs and the eyelids. Now, by the way, a good substitute for Vallejo Dark Rust is Rhinox Hide or Dryad Bark. Either of those will get you out of trouble. Watch up here how we control our brush. We manipulate our brush. We press it to that surface and guide it in and under the detail of that fur. We're going to learn to be in control of our brush, not the other way around. For the runts skin, let's just add a little bit of Zandri dust into that Mezgob skin base mix, about one to one or so. Now this is just going to make the skin look a little bit lighter for the runt, because runts usually have lighter skin than the big fellas. And by in introducing a color like Zandri dust to Mezgob skin base, it means that the runt and the boss are going to relate to each other. Their skin's going to look similar, but different. But not too different that it looks weird and not too similar that it's like, well, it just looks the same, bro. Alright, let's check them out side by side and see if you agree with me. Now we got Vallejo Metal Color. What a metallic paint range this is. This color's called Duraluminium or something. It's basically like a really light silver. And we're going to use it to paint all of the parts of the metal that we want to be really light silver. Like these ball joints here. And the interior parts of the struts. And all those sorts of mechanical moving parts that are usually a bit cleaner than the rest of the, the junk that orcs put together. The next metallic from this range is called Exhaust Manifold. That's a lot easier to say. Now we're going to use this to paint the rest of his armor. All the other bits that his scrap armor is made from. This is cool because it's a dark and dirty silver. It's got a lot of brown in it. And it's a lot darker than that other silver that we were using. So we're going to use this to paint everything else that we want to be metallic. And it's such a beautiful paint range. Look how easily it glides on. We've thinned this with water, remember? And it's still going on smooth. We might not even need to do a second coat. See this little bit here? Let's not paint that. Let's just leave that black. That's actually negative space. So we'll leave it black so that it implies that there's nothing there. How cool is his spanner? I love sculpting little details like that. Just little bits of story, like maybe some kind of runt has left a spanner there at some point. Yeah, there's quite a lot of metal on this guy, but we're just getting through it all, aren't we? We're doing a good job laying down a solid coat of this exhaust manifold. Now watch how we just twirl that axe around while we glide the brush up and down. Let's sit back and have a look at our parts. See how we're going with the elements. We've done our silver and our skin. We've done the leather parts. Let's do a bit of copper. We're going to use this just to break up the metal a little bit more. Like we've got a little bit of that aluminium. We've got exhaust manifold. Now we're going to have a bit of copper. Picking out a few little random bits and pieces like this little gas tap here. A few nuts and bolts. The gauze holding in the jerry can. His little rain cap. Now that keeps the rain out of exhaust, doesn't it? Just whatever parts we feel like we want to paint copper, we'll just paint it copper. We're just going to do what we feel like. No one's going to stop us. We've got to do his little bullets here, the little projectile parts of the bullets. And his little 50 cal ammo case. As well as his, his shocks on the back of his legs. Now this is one of my favorite paints. It's called Blighted Gold by P3. Now I know his lid's broken. Don't worry about that. He does a good job. It's what's on the inside that counts. It's honestly a beautiful paint. It's my, it's, it's my go-to for gold. And we're going to use it today to paint these spent ammo casings. Scattered all along the top of Mez Gob's lid. Obviously the runt's been going ape. Blasting bloody everything in sight. He's even spilt some all over the ground here. I'll make sure we get them. Now we need to do two thin coats of this gold. And also we've got some bullets in the Runts 50 cal. Don't want to be forgetting those. 
and we also have a little gold medal of honor on the belly plate of Mezgob. He's pinched that from some kind of boss. Next we're going to use some Rakarth flesh. Get it on our wet palette and thin it down so that it runs nice and smoothly. Then we're going to start painting some of these pipes. At this stage we decided that we want some of these pipes to be a kind of fleshy color. We're also going to use Rakarth flesh to paint the gauges and the dials. Now there are a lot of pipes on Mezgob's super suit. And we're really not sure what we want to do with any of them at the moment. There's so many options. We could paint them black or tan or multicolored. So my advice is when, when you're not sure what color to paint something, just paint it a neutral color for now. And you can always come back and adjust it later on. So for now we're just keeping all of our pipes Rakarth flesh. Check out his little Siggy. Let's paint that with Rakarth flesh too. This is going to be white, but you notice that we're not going to be using much white on this miniature. For this paint scheme, white equals Rakarth flesh or Zandri dust. There's a little pipe here inside his iron jaw. We want to paint that with Rakarth flesh. That's actually one pipe that we're going to leave and we're not going to change later on. Now I just want to point out this little piece of paper here, this little warning label on one of his struts. We want to paint that with Rakarth flesh too. Let's hook out some Abaddon black. Thin it down with a bit of water. Find the right consistency for the job. So that we can begin cleaning up the miniature a little bit. Clean up his little bum patch here. We're going to paint his belt black. As well as this little bit of negative space up here and you can see why there was no point painting that silver before so we just didn't we're just working our way around this miniature finding anything that we think should be black and making it so like this little runt's hat here he thinks he's some kind of boss with his hat i think now on the back of mezgob's engine he's got some serious oil leaks we're going to paint those oil drips black. Now, it's a little bit tricky, but don't worry, we're just going to do our best. And if we make any mistakes, we're not going to worry about it. It's not the end of the world. We'll just grab some Rakarth flesh and fix it back up again. He's also got a few oil splats up on his lid too. We'll want to make sure we hit those. Oh, biscuits. Have a look at our brush. That brush is filthy. Let's get some brush conditioner. Onto the job, get some in the palm of our hands and start gently twirling and twisting and rubbing our brush through that conditioner and see if we can get some dried paint to come out of it, like what we've got here. That's exactly what we don't want, clogging up our brush. If we look after our brush, our brush will look after us. Let's get Zandru Dust into this party. Welcome Zandru Dust. We're going to be using you quite a lot on this miniature. For now we're just starting to base coat the horns with Zandru dust, but we're going to use this to base coat any bones, any skulls, and any teeth. We're not only going to be using Zandru dust to base coat that stuff, but we're going to be mixing it into our mid-tones and our base tones to create highlights that we're going to use across the different elements of the miniature. It's going to be used as a highlight on the pants, the skin, the fur, and the base. And this is what I call harmonizing. Harmonizing, right? That's when you, you take a color and you share it across the elements. You're using that same color for different parts of the miniature. But it makes each one of those elements, each one of those different parts, feel like it's reflecting the same kind of light and it's in the same kind of environment. So it creates harmony, see? So, I just make this stuff up. Hmm. Rakarth Flesh. Let's use you now. We've got a few stitches to paint. On his little bum, his little bum flap here. He must have sat down on something sharp to get a hole in his pants. We've got some stitches up here in his bicep. Where some bionics are poking out. 
Now remember, these are just stitches, they're not important. So we don't want to be painting them any kind of crazy color. Don't want to be drawing attention. Here's his jerry can. We, we've no idea what color we want to paint that at the moment. So neutral color. Rakarth flesh is our neutral color that we're just going to be painting things that we don't want to stand out. And that includes what we're doing right here. We're starting to paint a few random panels with Rakarth flesh. A few random panels on his armor. Now this is the point where you could be painting this armor blue or red or yellow or whatever specific clan it is that you want to paint your boss. But old Mezgob here, he's from the Scrap Lads clan and they ain't got no color. They just make their stuff out of junk. So in the interest of breaking up this armor and all this metal, Today we're using Rakarth flesh for these panels. But remember, you could be using any kind of blue or red or whatever color you want at this point. Now while we're painting those random panels, let me tell you a little bit about the Scrap Lads. There was a planet, and humans used this planet for hundreds and hundreds of years as a dump. And every 34 years they sent a recon drone to scan the planet for signs of life, signs of greenery. And in the most recent scan, they did send back signs of greenery, but not the sort you want. They're freaking orcs. There's freaking orcs everywhere, mate. This is a bloody dump, but to an orc, it's a gold mine. They've been making all sorts of war machines and stuff out of all this shit. Bloody factories of guns and orc robots and stuff. They got bikes and whiz tanks and bazillions of runts and... Uh, sorry, I digress. Let's get back to it. We're using some thinned down Abaddon black to paint some very thin lines, as thin as you can make them. Start horizontally first, and then cross them with some vertical lines, making a grid pattern, as thin as you can make it. And once we've got our nice neat grid, we can start colouring in our squares. We'll start with one black square, and then we're going to colour in the next diagonally opposite square and then the next diagonally opposite square and so forth. And what we're not going to do is get impatient and start painting some random square on the other side of the checkerboard. Because I can tell you right now, we're most likely going to do it in the wrong square. And that's pretty upsetting. Now once we've done all of our squares in the correct spot, and they're all opposites, we need to do a second coat. Because we've done that first coat very thin. And thin is what you want. Once we've finished those checks, let's do the exact same thing to both sides of the axe blade. Start with our thin lines. And notice that mine are a little bit wonky. That's okay. I'm doing my best. It doesn't have to be perfect. You've got to remember that an orc's done this. Once we've got our grid, we just start filling in our squares again, just like before. And then we do a second coat to darken them up, make them nice and strong, black as the night. Did you see how we just swung that axe around? That was impressive. Once we're finished with our black, we're going to switch to Rakarth flesh and clean up the white squares. What we want is for each white square to come to a sharp point and they meet each other sharply in the middle. Good enough. Now let's use a little bit of Abbott on black to paint some tiny little text on this warning label on the hydraulic as well as some hazard stripes on his arm bracer. Again this is just random scrap just to break up the armor and make it seem a little bit more interesting and remind us that this is made out of absolute junk. Random crap. We're also going to be painting some hazard stripes on this pipe here. We're doing it black and white at the moment, or Rakarth flesh and black, with the intention of tinting it with a yellow ink later on, which we will do, and then we will repaint black. This is how the parts are looking. We've base coated all of the elements, and we've even added our freehand patterns. Before we can move on to the next stage, we're going to just add some battle damage, get a sponge, rip a few chunks out of that sponge so it's a bit random, dab it in some Abaddon Black, 
Let's start sponging battle damage onto this model. This is super fun. This is bloody easy. Just start poking it and stabbing it and swiping it and rubbing it. If you rub it, you can get these scratch effects. Like, if you rub the sponge um, horizontally, you're going to get horizontal scratches. And if you rub it vertically, you're going to get these vertical scratches and so forth. And this stuff is mostly going to stick to the edge, almost like dry brushing. We're even going to just battle damage up his axe here. Yep, have some fun with it. This is really fun, and it creates so much detail, and realistic detail too. Like, there are a lot of ways that you can add chipping, but this is definitely the easiest, and the fastest, and very effective. Once we've done that, we need to clean up some of the elements, like his pants. We don't want battle damage on his pants. That's just silly. He's got a little Medal of Honor down here, and a little tooth. We want to make sure that those are clean. His horns are clean. Any on his skin, any battle damage on his skin, fix that up. Alright, we're going to use Blood Angel's red contrast paint to paint the red sections of these gauges and dials on the back of Mezgob's engine. He's running this machine into the red. Of course he's running it into the red. What orc is not going to be using a machine to the limits? So let's make sure that we make these dials pointing into the red zone easy. Well, it's not easy, but we're just going to have to give it a go. Do our best. Well, we've made it to the end of part two. We've base coated our elements. We've even done our checker pattern, our, all our freehand. We've done the red section of the gauges. And we've even done some battle damage. Now it's time for part three. Part three. Let's add our wash and tone. Let's make a fully sick black wash. We're going to be using Lamy and Medium and Contrast Black Templar. The ratio is 5 to 2. So we're going to be using 10 drops of Medium to 4 drops of Black Templar. Now this wash is black as the night, but it's got a blue tint to it. It's beautiful. It's going to completely change the whole mood of this miniature. And it's going to be done in one coat. Now you could do something like Nuln Oil for this. But if you use Nuln Oil, you're not going to get that blue night feel. You're going to get more of a brownish black. Plus, if you're going to get into it with Nuln Oil, you're going to need to do two or three coats. Whereas with this guy, we're going to do it in one go. And we want to be applying this black wash over the entire miniature. That is all the elements except for the skin and the bone. We want to leave those areas clean and fresh. And how satisfying is that wash when it's dried? Give yourself a high five. This is a great point to be at because our miniatures, they go through this ugly stage. They're looking ugly for a very long time. And this is normal. We've got to push through this. But this is really the first milestone of realizing that our model doesn't look so shit all of a sudden. Next we're going to grab some Abaddon Black and thin it down with water. And we're going to glaze this onto the armor that we just washed. We're just reintroducing a bit of finesse and direction to the shades. A wash is mindless. It is going to find the gaps and it's going to find the gaps as quickly as it can and it's going to bulldoze everything out of the way until it gets there. So it creates a bit of destruction. So by glazing a little bit of Abaddon Black we can introduce a bit more control to the shades. We decide how dark they're going to be and where they're going to be. Next we're going to highlight the armor, specifically the Rakarth flesh parts that we painted. We're going to use Rakarth flesh for this. And this is the point where if you had painted your armor blue or red or black or yellow or whatever kind of um, clan you want to make this guy, you would be using a lighter color of that. For now we're using just Rakarth flesh because it's light enough. And all we need to do is highlight the underside of each scratch and paint chip so that it looks 3D and so that it looks like a big dent, a big gouge in his armor. We just want to make sure that we try to place these highlights as finely as we can, as delicately as we can, get those highlights as small as we can, 
just by gradually lowering our brush to the surface until it just touches it. Now check out his armor, he's been getting smacked by hammers, bullets has been bouncing off him, he's been rolling around in the concrete, he's been through the ringer. And now we're up to the next part. Part 4. Pants on the... Now we're starting with Steel Legion and Drab. Controlling it on the wet palette there, thinning it down with water. And then we're going to start laying down some colour on these pants. We're going to imagine that our light source is coming from the top. From the top right. So let's keep all of this Steel Legion Drab to only the tops of each fold. Never put any of this on the bottom of each fold. We want a nice strong transition between the undersides of each fold and the tops of each fold. Now this is quite translucent this paint but that's okay because we're going to go over this a second and maybe even a third time. We want to get a nice even coat of Steel Legion Drab along the top of his bum area but we want to keep it away from the bottom, from the underside there. We want to keep, it, keep that nice and dark. Now once we've finished our first layer of Steel Legion Drab, we're going to do it again. Except this time, we're going to keep to a smaller area than what we just did. So as an example, if we had painted an oval in our first layer, well this time we'll be painting a smaller oval inside that oval. And this creates some of the first steps in our transitions. So on these folds here, we'll be painting a smaller fold than what we just painted in our first layer. So to summarize what we've done with the pants so far, we base coated them with Steel Legion Drab. Then we did that Black Templar wash, darkening the whole thing down. Now we're using Steel Legion Drab again with thin layers to start building it up, start stepping it up again. We want them to stay nice and dark. Now we're going to use some Steel Legion Drab and we're going to mix it with Dark Rust. About three parts Steel Legion Drab to one part Dark Rust. It's not exact, but we just make it look sort of like what we got here. And just like before, how we were painting the tops and the peaks of the folds, well this time we're going to paint only the undersides of each of the folds because what we want is a really strong transition between light on the peaks of the folds and dark underneath them. Next we're going to mix some Zandri dust into it. So we're going to have Zandri dust and Steel Legion Drab about one to one. And then we're going to have this kind of range. We're going to have Steel Legion Drab, then Steel Legion Drab mixed with Zandri dust and then Zandri dust by itself plus a little bit of dark rust over there on the other side. So we're going to be able to just select, pick whichever color we want for the job. But for now, we're going to stick with our Xandri dust and Steel Legion drab mix of about one to one. And all we've got to do is start increasing the highlights, focusing on the tops of the folds, just like before when we were using Steel Legion drab to get those peaks of the folds. We want to do exactly the same thing, except this time we're just going lighter. At this point we want to start trying to get a bit of control with our brush and trying to keep our highlights as neat as possible now and prevent any, any of this lighter color from creeping onto the undersides of the folds. We really want that transition to be very distinct between light and dark. I made sure to sculpt those creases nice and sharp for us so that it makes it a bit easier. Now we get to pick from our buffet of colors a bit of Xandria dust by itself. We've got that range where we just get to choose whichever color we want at any time. And now all we're doing is increasing the range again, just going lighter and lighter. But notice this time we're getting a bit of stipple action going. We're just sort of poking and prodding the brush onto the miniature and that's creating these tiny little dots and those little dots they build up and they create texture. Now we can jump between stippling and line work. We're going to do a bit of everything. Let's jump back down the range for a minute. Let's grab some Steel Legion Drab mixed with Xandri Dust. 
we're going to use this to just lightly glaze some of the transitions just blurring the line between the Zandri dust and the Steel Legion drab because when we're doing these highlights we're creating quite sharp steps and we need to select the in-between colors from our buffet on our wet palette to blur out those lines. Let's get some of this dark rust into the bottom end of that Steel Legion drab and we can continue working on the shades and the underside of these pants darkening the bottoms of them and then we can step down a little bit further still by using some dark rust by itself and just running that into these creases now let's expand our highlights even more we're going to insert some Rakarth flesh into this mix, into the top end of this mix, and we really want to lighten these pants up. Now your go-to might be to add white into this mix to brighten up, but we're using Rakarth flesh, aren't we? You know why? Because we want to create harmony. We talked about that before. We want to reuse colors that we've already used across the miniature. This is recycling. Recycling is good for the environment, but it's also good for painting miniatures. Because when you share colors across the miniature, the different elements will harmonize together. Now we're using our Rakarth Flesh Mix to stipple more texture onto these pants. The objective here is both to create a bit more texture, but also to refine our blends, because stippling is a beautiful way of creating smooth blends. Place those dots closer to each other and the color gets stronger but place them further from each other and watch them fade away. Now you have to be aware of what's going on with your brush at all times. Always be in control. You're the boss of the brush. The brush isn't the boss of you. The brush isn't holding your hand. You're holding its hand. But see how the brush can get a bit rough? That's a bit of a manky brush now. When you're stippling and getting into it, your brush can get a bit frayed and a bit hairy and a bit forky. But we're not going to worry about it because we're in control of this brush and we're going to use that forky brush to our advantage. Now instead of doing one dot at a time, we're now doing two or three dots at a time. And that's efficiency. Now I'm loving the texture on these pants, but it can get a little bit crazy sometimes. We need to sometimes smooth out these dots. So we're going to use exactly the same color, but just to mix a little bit of water onto our brush, just a tiny bit, and just gently glaze it over those dots. And that's going to kind of smooth our texture a little bit. So this is a combo of selecting colors from our buffet, stippling and glazing. That's how we're going to make these pants smooth. And now we're going to use Rakarth Flesh just by itself, gently glazing it one last time. This is the final highlight for these pants. There we go. Now we've got one more detail to do on these pants, but before we can do that, we've got to finish off the runts pants and we're going to paint them exactly the same as how we painted the boss pants. So there's no point going through it again. It's exactly the same. Now, once the boss's pants and the runts pants are at that stage, we're going to start painting these tufts of fur. We just need to use steel legion drab to start painting the ends of them. Now they've been base coated with steel legion drab and they've had that really heavy black wash. Oh man, that was a mean wash. So they're very dark. So all we need to do is paint the tips of them. But the tips are very sharp. They're actually cheeky buggers is what they are. And they tend to split the brush and make it go a little bit forky. Now if that happens, just give a little twist on your thumb there. Ring its neck, sharpen him up and show him who's boss. Now on this model, I sculpted some of these little knots, these little bits of twine, rope, string, whatever you want to call them. We're going to rebase coat those. We're going to use Zandri dust for that. There's some on his horn rack. There's some in his belly, holding some pipes and cables together. And there's also some on the back of his engine here, holding more cables together. 
Let's have a quick look at him and see how he's pulling together. And then we're going to get back to his pants. Just finish off his pants. We're going to add some scratches. We're going to need some thinned down Abaddon black. Super thin. Control that brush. Make it so thin. As thin as possible. And then just start scratching up these pants. Make those scratches random. As random as possible. Go left. Go right. Go up. Go down. Just make them delicate. That's the most important thing. See how we're just holding the brush above the surface and we're just swiping, we're just swiping air. Not hitting anything, we're just swiping. Swipe and swipe and swipe again and just gradually lower that brush until it hits the surface. That's how you get the finest touch. And that's what I call kissing the model. So remember, when you're doing these kinds of really fine scratches, remember to kiss the model. Gently like you would your partner. You don't just show up with a paintbrush and slap her in the face. Now once we've done with that, we need to highlight each one of those scratches and we need to make sure that we're going to highlight on the right side, the correct side. So as we're looking at the front of him, we're looking at the back right now, so turn him around and have a look at the front. And as we're looking at the front, the light is going to be coming from the top right hand side, which means that we need to highlight the bottom or the left hand side of each scratch. And now we come to the next part. Part 5. Let's paint Mezgob's skin. This is going to be a doozy. Now we've already base coated the skin using our Mezgob skin base mix, but let's mix up some more using Niles Green and Vallejo Dark Rust, but this time we're going to mix some Zandri Dust into it. We're going to make a range, we're going to make a buffet, we're going to make a swatch library with four or five colours to choose from. Then, we're going to start by picking one of the mid-tone ranges and start mapping out the light. I know what you're thinking, you're thinking I have no idea where to place the light. Let's pause it right there for a minute. I agree with you, I think that's a pretty tricky thing to figure out by yourself. So let me help you out. Let me let you in on one of my tricks. Now the first thing we've got to do is lay down a nice, solid, matte base coat on the skin. And we've already done that. We did that before. That was the Mezgob skin base. We can feel good about it. We've already done the first thing. Now notice how we've paused it. And have a look at Mezgob's muscles in his arm there. Can you see how the light is already reacting to each one of those muscles in his arm. And we haven't even highlighted anything. These are just the natural lights on your desk pointing at the muscles and they that you know what that is? That's wisdom. There's wisdom all around you and all you need to do is gather it up. Just be aware of your surroundings. Now we know where to place our lights. What you can actually do is get your phone out and take a photo of this. Now one thing you need to be aware of is as you turn the model around under your lights, the lighting on the arms is going to change. So you need to be aware of what it looks like from a specific angle. We're going from this angle at the top. And like I said, get your phone out and take a photo of it if you want so that you know how it's going to look. Now, look at his glowing arm. This is where we're going to place our highlights. Another thing I want you to be aware of is the creases. Have a look at these creases. Don't call them recesses. Recesses are different. These are creases. And I want you to think of creases as one shape drastically and suddenly changing shape and direction into another shape. For example, where the tricep transfers into the brachialis right here. And creases aren't trenches. Creases reflect light like a mirror. They love light. So from now on, when we see creases, we're going to highlight them. We're not going to darken them down with shades and things. The areas that we do want to darken down are the undersides of the muscles here. Now, I think we've done a pretty good learn, so let's get back to our painting, eh? Now, as I said, we don't really want to be doing a wash on this muscles because that's just going to fill all the creases with black stuff, and that's not what we want. So here's the plan. We've done our base coat, we've analysed where to place our lights, and now we're using a mid to high range green to actually place those highlights. And when we're placing these highlights, we're not glazing at all. 
not at the moment at least, we're using opaque paint. And for those who don't know what opaque means, it means this. It means not transparent. So a wall is opaque because you can't see through it. But a window is transparent because you can see your neighbours through it. Mowing their lawn and all that. So whenever we're mapping our highlights, we have our solid pants on. We don't have our transparent pants on right now. We're just... We're sketching. We're being very sketchy. And that's the word you need to think about when you're mapping highlights is you're just being sketchy. And once we've finished mapping our highlights, then we can begin refining our highlights and smoothing it out. And that's when we'll put our transparent pants back on and start getting some transparent paint, some translucent glazing and stuff. But for now, let's continue creating something to refine, and we're going to select a little bit more of a lighter green from our buffet of greens. And in all that initial mapping that we just did, we're about to paint this lighter green within those highlights. So think of this as kind of a step effect. We're stepping up, stepping up from a mid-tone green to a lighter green. And that's how we create the next level of highlights. But it's also going to create a little bit of a sharp jump from one green to the next. But we're going to fix that. We're going to smooth that step out. Turn it into a bit more of a ramp, aren't we? We're not worrying about it right now, though. All we're doing is getting that first highlight that we just did, and we're making it better. We're stepping it up and making it a bit brighter. Now, this is a time-consuming process. It's probably the most time-consuming part of painting this orc's skin. But we want to get it right, at least as right as we can, and, and early on too, because once we've got that mapping right, then all we need to do is refine it and smooth it out. We're going to be watching quite a bit of the process here of painting the skin, and a lot of it is much the same. We just jump from one muscle to the next. We focus on one muscle and then when we get that right we jump to the next one and then once we've done all the muscles on the arm we go back around and do it again it's a process of refining and tweaking and getting it right now this is the first release for mezgaic miniatures it's the first miniature and it's the first painting tutorial this is mezgob the scrap boss and he's one of the bosses of the scrap lads clan he was released on the Mezgaik Patreon during the month of April 2022. So if you're watching this and it's not that month, that means he's not available on Patreon anymore. But this full video, the full two and a half hour tutorial of how to paint Mezgob, that is always on Patreon. That lives there forever. You're going to get every new Mezgaik video tutorial on Patreon no matter what day it is. And if you ever want the Mezgob miniature, you can always get it from the website mezgaik.com so if you've not already subscribed to the mezgaik patreon make sure you do because every single month you're going to get the brand new miniatures to download and print plus a painting tutorial showing you how to paint them and you're not going to miss out anyway let's get back to it eh we're still using that same kind of green there that bright green, top end of the green spectrum. And we mixed a little bit of water with it and just wicked away some of the water on the tissue just to absorb the brunt of it so that it doesn't drip out all over the place. And now what we're going to do is just blur the line between the light step and that medium step. So as we talked about before, we made a bit of a step between that light highlight and the medium tone. So now we just need to kind of blur that line a bit and there's a multitude of ways that we can actually do that we could glaze over it just sort of scribble a glaze over the top of it we could select the exact midpoint color and just paint over that line we could even get some stippling going and just stipple it out you could even dry brush it even just a nice controlled dry brush there's a lot of ways we could smooth out that step and we don't really want to do any one technique. We could just do a bit of all of it if we want. You can see here we're grabbing a little bit of a mid-tone and stepping back down. We're continuing that blurring out process. Blurring all those lines. 
specifically selecting that color that we want from our buffet. Getting between the light and the medium sections, making it smooth. And we just go back up again, straight back to the top. Almost pure as Andrew dust now, just increasing those highlights. I'm about to give you a mad tip now. I want you to practice this and it's going to put your miniatures to the next level. All right? I want you to start tucking your kids in. Okay? I don't care if you hadn't got any kids. Mez gobs your kids. Mez gobs biceps are your kids. Mez gobs triceps are your kids. See what we're doing? We're tucking in our kids. Tucking in our highlights. Getting that brush right in tight. Make it a cozy. So where one muscle meets the next muscle, we don't want loose bed sheets. We don't want floppy highlights, we want tight highlights. We want the brighter part of this bicep to meet the darker part of the deltoid with a nice sharp transition. And when we have any corners, we want to take that as an opportunity to tuck our kids in real good. We want to make those corners very sharp and very tight and very cozy. And that's what I call tucking your kids in. So when we're painting this skin, we just jump back and forth. We go light and we go dark. And now we're trying to get a bit more finesse on these highlights. This is basically pure Xandru dust right now, making those highlights as powerful as we can. Now notice our choice of highlight color. We started off with our Mezgob skin base mix, which is made from Niles Green and Vallejo Dark Rust. But where did Xandru dust come from? Well, we're always trying to think about harmony, aren't we? We're using Xandru dust to highlight things like the leather and the fur and the horns and the base later on. So we're using that to highlight the skin as well. Putting the skin in the same environment as the rest of the miniature. Okay. Let's just take a bit of this mid-tone green and we're going to expand the range of the highlight down here on his tricep. I'm not too happy with how it just transitions from dark to light so suddenly. So all we do is just select some of that mid-tone green and glaze it over the dark areas. And just increase that mid-tone. And then we can go back to the darker Mezgob green color and blend that out a little bit more. And I reckon this arm's good enough for now. It's not actually complete, but it's good enough for us to move on to the rest of his anatomy. Like this arm over here, as well as his belly and his face, and that other hand holding the ciggy. And we want to get all of these parts of his anatomy to the same level as his right arm. And then what we can do is work on them and tweak them and adjust them so that each part of his anatomy relates to the others and you know like one arm isn't really light and the other arm isn't really dark for example but for now it's really just about painting one part of his anatomy at a time we've done his right arm now we're doing his left arm and we're going to do it in exactly the same way as how we did his right arm we analyze the model and check out how the light reacts to each one of those muscles on that arm and then what we do is just map the light and then select colors from our library of colors that we've created on our wet palette to blur out those highlights and smooth it. We want to make sure that these little parts of the skin here where he's got a bit of bionics popping out, we want to lighten those up and show them a bit of attention. Because when the viewer is holding our model and checking it out, they're looking at it. They need to understand exactly what's going on. They need to understand where one element ends and another begins. They need to know where the skin suddenly ends and the bionics begin. Otherwise, they're going to get confused. They're going to be like, this was skin and now it's kind of metal. I'm confused. So we don't want that to happen. What we need to do is define each area. Highlight each area where one ends and the next begins. So we can think of it as a fence, a fence created by contrast and highlighting, keeping the confusion out 
and the awesomeness in. Look at these elbows, knuckles and fingers. These are all very sharp, prominent areas that we want to highlight. You could also use human skin colors in these areas. Pinks, purples, browns, oranges, whatever. I wasn't really in the mood for it, to be honest, with Mezgob. I don't want to add all those colors to his skin this time. Usually I do. Usually I'll glaze a bit of purple or a bit of Kislev flesh or something like that over the knuckles and the elbows. But today, we just want this orc to be green. Let's move on to the face now. Map out those highlights. Find the very sharp areas like the cheekbones and the top of the brow, things like that. That's where we usually want to start with a face, cheekbones, brow, nose, chin, jaw, all these things are landmark areas. And after we've done that, we can start finding the prominent fleshy areas, like the big wrinkles here and the lips. Like these, these wrinkles under his lip here, they're very prominent and they're going to catch a lot of light. Now something different with this face is it's going to have an underlight an underglow that's going to be coming from his eye and jaw beneath his chin. We know this is going to happen. We've planned it. We want this to happen. So we're thinking about that direction of light coming from below. So every fold of skin around his jaw area is going to be highlighted on the bottom side, not the top. So while all the rest of the skin is being highlighted as though Mezgob is out in the sun or something, you know, like there's a light coming from above, we want to make sure that we map the light area around his jaw so that it's highlighted towards the front and down. So once we've mapped that light, you know the drill. We just pick the next color down in the range and start painting it. Look how easy it is to just create a very subtle blur. That's the concept of it. And then we just refine it. We just choose the next green and the next green and get a little bit of glazing going on, a bit of stippling going on. Whatever we've got to do, we're going to do it. We're not going to do one thing or the other. We're going to do all of it. And just remember that when we map those original highlights, that's not the end of it. We can always refine it. We can always fix it. We can always expand the range of each highlight if we need to. Like if the face is looking a bit too extreme, like where it goes from light to dark too fast, we just expand that mid-range. Select the color that we want from our library of colors and just expand that, widen that area of the mid-tone. Re-establish the highlights, re-establish the shades. Tweaking, aren't we? That's what we're doing. Back and forth until it looks right. Now, of course, this is extreme painting. This is this is kind of like if you are making a display miniature or painting for a competition or something. But if you just want to get this done quick, if you just want to paint like an orc army or something, this can be simplified right down. All we've got to do is just select the colors that we've got here, mix them up on our wet palette. That's easy. It's not hard. It's not time consuming. Just have a go. Anyone can do it and it's going to change your world. But yeah. All you've got to do is just use the colors that we're using here and simplify the process. Find the process that works for you. You might really love stippling and you might absolutely bloody hate glazing. Glazing is a very slow process. It creates a very smooth finish, baby bum finish, but it's slow. You might just want a base coat with Mezgob base green and edge highlight with a lighter version of it. Um, but no matter what you do, no matter what your process, if you just choose the same colors that we've got here, you're going to get a similar effect. You're going to get a similar color range and we're going to be vibing in the same area. You know what I'm saying? It's mostly just your render that's going to look different depending on which process you choose and how long you want to spend refining it because that's a balance that we all need to find how good we want something to look versus how long we want to take to do it. Like if I was painting this miniature for an army, I wouldn't be spending this much time smoothing out tiny little folds of skin on his face, you know? So if I was painting this for an army, I would start by mapping out all the light as we did, sketching it. And I would maybe do one in-between pass to smooth 
out those highlights and that's it. So it wouldn't look as smooth and as finished as what we've got here but it's still going to look really effective and it's not going to take that long. So now we're using Xandru Dust by itself to increase the highlights in the face because Xandru Dust is such a beautiful and warm colour. It's a nice yellow deserty colour and that's introducing a lot of warmth to this face and that's what we want because we want the face to be lighter and warmer than the rest of his body because our eyes are naturally drawn to the thing that is lightest. So let's make his face lighter than his biceps because his face is more important than those. Now let's get some of our Mezgob skin base and we'll mix a bit of water with that. We're going to glaze a little bit behind the teeth, introduce a little bit of shadow behind the teeth glaze them down a bit. This is going to help the teeth stand out from the skin and make them pop out, make them stand out when we paint those later on. Now we've painted all the skin, we've got it all roughly to the same level and the same standard across each part of his anatomy and it's a bit, it's a bit inconsistent though because his right arm looks a little bit darker than his left arm. So let's fix it up, let's lighten it up. Back to our wet palette and our buffet of greens and we're just going to select the one we want. That's basically Xandry Dust by itself, isn't it? What we want to do is expand that range of highlights on that arm and lighten this whole arm so that it matches the other arm. Now, we could use a variety of techniques to get this sorted out, as you know. We can stipple it, we can glaze it, we can straight up be selecting the exact colour that we want from our library of greens. But what we're doing is stippling because we want that texture. We want that nice spotty skin texture. The skin's basically finished now, good enough. I'm over it now. Let's do the next thing. We can give it a little bit of a tweak and a little bit of a straighten up later on when we get to the end of the miniature. We like to do a little bit of a touch up at the end. But for now, this skin on this fella is done. I feel like we're forgetting something though. Oh, this cheeky little cut, uh, runt just when we thought we were finished with the skin. Not to worry, he's just a little fella and we'll get him done quick. Let's get some Rakarth flesh and just dump it into our green library. We're going to start mixing that Rakarth flesh into each one of those colour swatches. And just start mapping out the lighting on this little runt. You know how to do this now. We've talked about it before, I've shown you how to do it. We just analyse the light how it reacts to our base coat and to each one of those muscles and we just start copying it. It's as easy as that. We're just going to speed this up now because we're experts, we know how to do this. You don't need me to explain it again, do you? No. Now remember we base coated this runt skin with a little bit of lightness to it. We added that Rakarth flesh to it, didn't we? And that's why we're adding Rakarth flesh to the highlights because we want this runt to look a little bit different to the big boss but we don't want him to look so different that it looks weird. And here's how it looks when it gets to this sort of stage and we just build it up to this as we've done for the last, I don't know, bloody 20 minutes painting skin. Lay down your highlights, place your midtones, and blend it out. Righto, we've just been hit by the big boy, the big drum that means it's time for part six. Fur, black stuff, pipes, bones, and his Siggy. We're mixing up a mix of Xandru Dust and Steel Legion Drab. Same as before. Now we're going to use this to highlight the ends of the tufts of fur. You probably remember, we've done a little bit of work to the fur already. Now it's time to finish it off. Time to take it to the next level, the final level. And that means just using this mix to paint sort of the end three quarters of each tuft. And we'll leave that black wash earlier towards the base of each tuft. And then we're going to switch to Xandry Dust by itself. Venture a little bit further towards the tip of each tuft. Creating a little bit of a transition. A little bit of gradient. We're not going to get too stuck into these blends here though. We're not going to worry about too much. This is manky fur. Steel Legion Drab, mixed with Abaddon Black now. Mix it up about two to one. And start focusing this 
towards more towards the base of each tuft just cleaning up a little bit glaze it down just make them look a little less messy we've done both sides now now it's time to lighten it up just a pinch get a bit of rakarth flesh on the wet palette just by itself and we're just going to hit the very tips of each one of those tufts just like a little white dot except it's not white is it we're not using much white at all on this miniature we'll use it a little bit later on when we're doing some glow effects and stuff but for most cases if you want to paint something white on this model we're doing it rakarth flesh or Zandri dust okay let's paint the black stuff now we're going to use abaddon black and rakarth flesh we're going to mix up a range just like we do with the skin and the pants and we want to pick somewhere around the mid range and start mapping out the highlights on the black areas again this is just the same as the skin we're just going to kind of observe how the skin reacts to the surface and we'd already painted those areas with a base coat of Abaddon black so we can see how the light's already hanging out on those areas we're just replicating it and copying it we have this little section on his hand here his palm not sure what we're going to call that maybe it's a bit of insulation yeah let's call it insulation because he's got a big zapper axe and this is going to stop his body from getting electrocuted let's go with that well anyway it's kind of got this ribbed texture to it and it's sculpted in such a way as to mimic the muscles of the hand now i'm not sure what those muscles are called let's just call one of them palm muscle and the other one thumb muscle we've also got this little black leather bit under his arm bracer on, on his right arm we're not going to do anything too fancy with it just highlight and give it a little bit of attention make it look like we've tried you've got to do that kind of thing when you strap for time you can't spend the same amount of effort on everything so you need to pick the most important areas and give those areas the most attention we're going to give a little bit of attention to this jerry can well the cap on the jerry can it's quite an interesting and angular shape so we're going to give it a little bit of attention and make it nice we're going to paint this little runts boss cap we want it to look shiny so we don't want to be painting too much gray on it if you want to paint black and make it look shiny you've got to be really minimalistic with the amount of gray that you use keep the range small keep most of the surface area black and just do some little shines of gray then highlight them up to a bright shine same deal with his boots and his belt we don't even want to venture much further than just a thin line here and there we're not even going to highlight around every edge just the prominent ones just the bits that we want to look shiny and sharp the points of his boots anything that's a cylindrical shape you want to do a line down it that's how light reacts to cylinders like this ammo belt here this is made of tiny little cylinders so we want to do parallel lines and now just like we did with the skin we select a lighter gray and we just paint within those highlights that we just painted just building up those highlights the transitions and the steps so we create those steps and then we refine those steps and smooth them out by picking the in-between colors and remember we want to keep these highlights very subtle and small look at the shape of this part of his boot it's almost like a cylinder so we're going to interpret it as a cylinder and we're almost just going to do a line down the center of it his insulation glove it's ribbed so we need to highlight each one of those ribs but we also need to remember the shapes as a whole so we're highlighting here his palm muscle that's what we're calling it as well as his thumb muscle here each one is as a whole almost like a cylinder it's cylindrical in shape or maybe even spherical i'm not really sure make up your own mind it's, it's interpretive and how we interpret it determines how we should highlight it where we should place those highlights 
And if we're not sure how to highlight a sphere versus how to highlight a cylinder, just get an object. Find an object in your house and pick it up and have a look at it and learn about it. Learn how the light reacts to it. Like cylinders, they often reflect a straight line, almost a straight line, straight down the center, parallel to the shape of the cylinder. Whereas a sphere will kind of reflect a circular shape on the surface of the object. And this kind of stuff will help you in the way that you paint black. Because you can paint black in a kind of non-metallic metal style. That's what we're doing. It's almost like non-metallic metal. But to paint non-metallic metal, you need to understand how light reacts to each different shape and surface. Again, we've got cylinders right here, so we're just painting lines. That's how it works. If we were to paint some other kind of random highlight shape, it's not going to read right. It's not going to look properly. And no matter how nicely you render it, or smooth it out, or have a nice transition, or anything like that, it's going to be strange no matter what. And you know what that's going to do? That's just going to confuse our viewer. And we really don't want to confuse our viewers. These rib sections, they're beautiful to paint on a 3D printed miniature. If this was a cast or plastic cast miniature, those ribbed sections would be filled with mold lines, wouldn't they? And that's one of the really nice things I've noticed about 3D printed miniatures. You can get away from those mold lines. We do still need to always be dealing with those support points, but they're a lot easier to deal with than mold lines. Imagine a plasma coil or something, trying to clean the mold lines out of that. We've been there, we've all been there, it's a nightmare, isn't it? Anyway, back to the black. So, the process with black is this. You paint the highlights, and then we go back and forth, back to the dark, darken it down, because I often overdo the highlights on black, make them a little bit too bright. But I don't think that's a bad thing, that's just our process, that's just what we do. Because then all we need to do next is grab our Abaddon black, thin it down and glaze it. Darken it up, or darken it down. And then we just go back and forth between the lights and the darks until it looks, until it looks like black. Until it looks like a nice shiny black. The black that we're after, the black that we've been striving for and the black that we deserve. One thing I will say about black is this, it's a lot easier to darken it down than it is to lighten it up. So when we're doing black, we don't want to be using light colors to be glazing around the place because that leaves white pigment all over the place. And we don't want white pigment being left all over the place. What that does is makes everything chalky. You know, when you're trying to glaze and you get that chalky finished, it's ugly, it's not what we want. It looks like someone's spilled a bucket of chalk on it or something. And that's happening because we're creating this very diluted solution filled with white pigment. And when you stretch that over the surface, it's being stretched too far, like butter scraped over too much bread, you know? And when that happens, the water evaporates and the pigment is left behind. Little tiny pieces of pigment, like little puppies, they're just lost, they're just left there. They don't know what they're doing. They stand out because they're white on a black surface, which makes them look chalky. So what we want to do is avoid it. When we paint black, we glaze down to darken the surface. We don't glaze up to lighten the surface. So we paint our lights. We paint them solid, we paint them opaque. We lay those down, we map those lights, and then we use the darker colors to blend down into the shades and if you do that when you're painting black you'll avoid that chalky finish you can generally get away with using lighter glazes on areas like the pants and the skin because the range isn't so extreme it's when you're using a light glaze over an extremely dark surface that's when you're going to run into trouble that's when you're going to get that streaky chalky finish all those lost little puppies now Remember we painted all those pipes, we painted them Rakarth Flesh. Well, we're going to highlight those. Even though later on we're going to change most of them to black, we won't be changing all of them, so let's just have a look at how we're going to highlight those, just with Rakarth Flesh. Here we're doing that hazard stripe hose on his left leg. Have a look at this. 
This is his little medal of honor that is pinched off some human. Now watch how we paint the highlight here. We've looked at how to highlight cylinders and spheres, but when there's a flat surface, the light tends to hit the top of it and travel along it and just sort of pop out the bottom. That's how I imagine it. It hits the top, it goes for a little road trip, it gets to the end and it just drives off the cliff. And where it drives off the cliff, it's generally a lot lighter. This is one of the main hoses, and we're going to end up leaving this one on as this Rakarth flesh color. We're digging how it's got that sort of bony color, like it used to be some kind of white hose, and now it's gone off white. Over the years, it's just gotten filthy. See how we've got some of that black Templar wash that we did earlier shining through. It's creating a lot of interest, almost like it's been scorched here and there. It's got oil stains that are soaked into it. So we're not going to try and paint over that too much. We're not going to blend them out. We're going to leave them, even though they're a little bit ugly, you know. But we're liking them because they're looking like oil stains. In fact, we've got oil dripping down this pipe. We painted that before together. What we're doing is creating a story. We've got the physical sculpted oil dripping down on one side, and then on the other side, we've got the corresponding black patches and stains enhancing that story, creating history and interest. These are visual cues that are giving us additional information to think about when we view this miniature. We just did it again with those gauges, creating additional story, weren't we? We're telling the viewer that this orc boss He's a mad boy. He's running this machine into the red. He's not looking after it. He's got oil dripping out of it. He's running out of fuel. His pressures are off tits. Any of his belts are like... Ss, 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 ss. Mate, he's got to take this thing to Tony the mech boss for a quick rego check and a service. So we're learning about Mezgob the scrap boss and who he is as a character. Now, we're going to use some Rakarth flesh to just refine the scratches on the pipes, as well as these dials, the white parts of these dials and gauges. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you the truth. This is hard. This is bloody hard work. Here's my tips. Number one, let's not whinge about it. Let's just give it a crack. Number two, turn the model. Bend it to your will. Find the angle that is most comfortable for you. You can't be painting these dials when there's something in the way. So turn the model and find that angle. Number three, always make sure that your hands are touching, your hands are together. This is stabilization. Press one hand against the other at all times and minimize shake. A steady hand isn't something you're born with, it's something that you create, it's something that you do. So when we're faced with these really fine details, the tricky stuff like that, just follow these three rules. But most importantly, just give it a go and don't worry if you make a mistake. We can always fix our mistakes, we can always learn from our mistakes, all right? And that's what it's all about. Mistakes equals wisdom. When you make mistakes, you learn from them. If you're never going to make mistakes, you're never going to make wisdom. It's as simple as that. Anyway, have a look at this brush. Look how fine it is. Whatever we're doing to our brush, we've kept it in control, haven't we? And we're doing a good job. We're getting very sharp edge highlights on the sides of this ammo belt here. Like we talked about earlier. We're distinguishing the edges where one element ends and the next one begins, preventing our viewers from getting confused. They know exactly what's going on with these bullets now. They can clearly see where the ammo belt ends and the actual bullets begin. And sort of use the edge of our brush here, not so much the point. We're using the point a little bit, but mostly we're just rubbing the edge of the brush. Look at that angle, isn't it beautiful? Just rubbing the edge to get that edge highlight there, making it super sharp. We've got this strapping here on the engine exhaust. We're just going to paint them exactly the same way as the pants. We're not going to go through it. No point, no point, no point. Just go back and have a look at how we did the pants again. What we're going to do next is paint those little ropey, stringy things, the little ties that are holding the cables together. We're going to use Steel Legion Drab with Abaddon Black and we're going to smash a bunch of water into it to make a wash and then just run it over those little stringy things. If you've got Agrax Earthshade or something like that, just use that instead. It will save you time. We're only doing it this way to reduce the amount of paints that we use and in turn save everybody a little bit of money. 
But one mistake I made is this. I used water to make this wash. Normally I don't do that. Normally I'll use a medium to make a wash. But for some reason this time, I was like, she'll be right. But it turns out it made a little bit of a mess. It was a little bit inconsistent when it dried. Not too bad, as you can see, it looks okay. But had we have used medium, it would have looked a little bit better and smoother. As you can see, we're painting a Siggy now, applying a little bit of shadow and definition to it. We're going to come back and finish it later though. For now, we're going to jump back to our wet palette. We need some Zandri dust. We need to highlight those little stringy bits, those little ropey things. I've got no idea what they're called, to be honest. They're just little bits of string or rope or something that tie stuff together. I'd use zip ties. But these are fun to paint and they look interesting. They're very orky and they're very scrappy. The process of painting them is pretty easy too. You base coat them, you wash them, and then you get a highlight color to highlight basically the top half of them. And there's not much else to it. It's an easy, an easy way of creating some nice definition. And see how we just flip the model around. We're finding that angle. We're finding the angle that's comfortable for us. We also have a few little bits of this stringy stuff down here holding this glyph to the chain on the boss's belly plate. And we paint that exactly the same as how we painted all that other string and rope. Now this chapter, part six, this is the first part of adding detail to the model, isn't it? We're kind of going around and starting to apply the details. Before that, we'd laid down most of the basics and now we're adding the details. It's time for the next stage of detail on the face of Mezgob, starting with Rakarth flesh. Let's add a bit more life to his face, to his cheekbones and brighten those up. The tops of his brow and his nose, they need a little bit more life, don't you think? Let's just add it, let's just give it to him. Let's liven him up a bit. Draw a bit more attention to his face. And it's always a good thing to be drawing more attention to the miniature's face. And an easy way of doing that is just lightening it up. We mentioned that before. We always want the face to be a little bit lighter than the rest of the model if possible. Now, while we're doing this, we want to keep our Rakarth flesh nice and thin. We don't really want to be getting chalky and chunky with it, we just want to be subtle with it. If you need more paint, we can always add more layers, but it's hard to take layers off. Now what we're doing is brightening up some of these edges on the face that we know are going to be lit by the underglow that we're going to add later on. That red hot glow that we talked about, and we're we wanting to make his face ready for it. We're getting his face ready for that glow. We'll get into that a little bit more later, but for now, let's just get some Abaddon Black, thin it down, and run it into this scratch on his eye, because we're not really sure what we're going to do with that at this stage, but we'll think about it later. We can leave it like that if we want. Now, for Mezgob's eye, we've previously painted it with Zandri Dust. Now we're going to use Blood Angel's Red Contrast and just run it over the eye. This is an easy way of painting orc eyes. You just get the hard stuff out of the way first, base coating it, and then you just do a red wash over it. You can also do this optional white dot on the eye, just giving it a little bit more depth. Now, that little wash we made earlier, the Steel Legion Drab and Abaddon Black that we used for the ropey things, we're using a little bit of that and glazing it onto his teeth. Now remember, just use Agrax Earthshade if you've got it. It's quicker and easy and you'll get the same kind of look. We just want this nice and controlled. We don't want to be infecting the skin or ruining it at all. We want to be nice and careful with it, okay? Let's also begin work on this orc skull here that's buried half in the ground. Using that same brown wash to start defining the shapes, define the teeth, define the jaw, the cheekbones, all those kinds of things, those landmark things. Let's mix a little bit of Abaddon Black into it and deepen it further. Further define those areas. Show the viewer where the deepest parts of the skull are. We've also got this little tooth here on his belly plate. We don't want to be forgetting about that. We're painting that exactly the same as how we paint the skull. Let's crack some Nuln oil out. 
dump some on the wet pallet. Don't mix any water with it. Why would we do that? Let's just use it straight up. What we're going to do is just gently, gently flood this into the bottom of his teeth, into where his lip goes, behind his lip there, into his mouth. Deepen that mouth. Let us know that the mouth gets deeper and there's stuff going on in it. We're also using it to glaze over the lips a little bit, just darken them up. Just going to further pop out his teeth just a little bit and make them a little bit more visually interesting as well as give a little bit more life and interest to the skin. Lips are always darker than the rest of the skin on our face. We're also going to add a little bit of null oil to the skull on the base. Find some of the shadows. This isn't about finding the recesses here, more like this side of the skull is going to be darker than that side of the skull. Then we're going to go back to the lips for a second coat of null oil. Now remember, you could be using a color here. You could be using purple like druchy violet or something, maybe even some kind of crimson. But we're just sticking with black for old Mezgob because we want his skin to look nice and green. We're going to hit his fingernails as well as between his fingers, darken those gaps right down, make them look nice and rich. Zandri dust, you're up. We're going to use Zandri dust, thin it down, not too much, just a little bit of water so that it runs nice and smoothly. And what we're going to do is highlight the teeth now. Similar to how we did the tufts of fur earlier. And we want to just keep this towards the top halves of each tooth. We've done that null oil at the bottom. So we don't want to be painting any of this into that area. Just focusing it onto the top. Get a little bit of a blend. Make them go from dark at the base to light at the tips. And we can't be forgetting about his sneaky little tooth down here on his belly plate. Where do you reckon he got that tooth from? I reckon he used his metal hand and backhand at some other orc boss in the face because he wanted his ciggy. I reckon Mezgob's a chain smoker, unfortunately. So anyway, we want this tooth to go from dark at the top to light at the bottom. But we still want to make sure that we hit those edges on the top, always making sure that we're defining the edges of each element. Finish them off. That's what we're doing now with these teeth. On the skull, this poor old dead orc here, defining his teeth. Making sure that that brush tip is always nice and sharp. Just twist its head off if it gets out of line. We're in control of this brush, just remember that. You're the boss of this operation. We're going to do a few passes of this Zandri dust. Once the first pass is done, it looks kind of like this. Now we're doing the second pass. We're just enhancing all the edges that we've done. Enhancing all of the highlights going over this second time. It just makes it stronger, it makes it brighter, it makes it better. Because now we can be selective of where we place that second pass. So as we layer up towards the tips of these teeth, they start looking really sharp and much more defined. We can even choose which side of the teeth we want to highlight. See these teeth here, we're highlighting only the upper sides of the teeth, the sides that are facing the sky, leading the undersides, the sides that are facing the ground, appear darker. It starts to make a bit of sense. We want to highlight his eye socket here, but only one side of it. Just so that it appears like there's a bit of lighting on it, the sun's shining on it from above. The eye sockets, the nasal cavity, as well as this little unfortunate bullet hole cracks, they're all prominent areas of the skull that we need to make sure that we give a bit of attention to. Make them really sharp. Give a bit of attention towards what's going on in the story there. As our bones and our skulls and our teeth start to near completion, we can switch to Rakarth flesh for the final stages of highlights. We're going to hit those very tips, ping the edges as I call them, Ping, that's what they do. It's like a little bit of light bouncing off and going ping. That's what's going on. A bit of light bounce. Bouncing off the very tips of each sharp edge. Now, this is the ultimate in defining the edges of each element. 
we draw attention to those interesting bits right at the corners of the nasal cavity, the very corners of the, of the bullet hole cracks. Ping the edges. And again, here on this little tooth on his belly plate, Watch how we use the Rakarth flesh to create that contrast, that edge definition, the fence. Our ongoing mission of preventing our viewers from getting confused about where one thing ends and the next begins. Now, here we're going to get back to our Mezgob skin base mixed with a little bit of Rakarth flesh. What are we doing? We're not giving him a manicure, that's for sure, but we are highlighting his nails. We're just going to show them a bit of love. We've hit them with a known oil before, but that's not enough. We need to define the edges. Create a little bit of shine and interest. Show the viewer that we care about them and we respect them enough to paint this guy's nails. Now this is basically the same process as when we painted his skin. It's all the same. We've got a library of greens here. We just add Rakarth flesh to it, add a little bit more, increase the highlights. And if we need to, get back to our wet palette get a bit of a mid-range green going, adjust things, smooth things out. If we take those highlights too far, back and forth until we're happy with the result. You could even paint the nails in the same way as the, that, that we painted the bones before, if you're into that, your own decisions. Now, I do wear a latex glove while I'm painting now. Sometimes I forget to put it on, but don't forget to put it on. Remember to put it on, you can reuse it. See how I've been using the shit out of it for this whole process. And I noticed that when I don't wear a latex glove, the oils in our hands, they just melt that paint straight off. See how he's tucked in there? Mez Gob, he's tucked in nice and cozy. He's comfortable, but if we weren't wearing a rubber glove, that paint would just be getting shredded off. He'd be going all shiny, the paint would be all stripping off. It's not going to make me happy, and it wouldn't be making you happy either. Anyway, we're going to be painting a Siggy now. I've been looking forward to this. Let's hit that filter with base coat of Zandru Dust. We're going to go over that with some orange soon, but for now, that's where we're going to start. Next, we're going to mix up some grey for the ash using Rakarth Flesh and Abaddon Black. It doesn't matter too much about the ratio here, just get a bit of a mid-tone grey and lay down some grey in this ash area on the end of his ciggy. Now, in a minute, we're about to mix up our own homebrew orange. We're doing this to recycle colors and reuse paints across the miniature. But if you guys have a different orange on hand, that'll be fine. Just use that. You don't have to mix this up. But for this video, we're using Riser Rust and Zandru Dust to mix up a kind of dirty orange for his Siggy Butt filter. And that's how we're laying it down. I originally sculpted Mezgob to be holding a cigar, smoking a cigar. But I changed it because I decided I want to get more character into him. Every second badass is holding a cigar these days, but you don't often find him. Observing the battlefield, pinching onto the end of a little manky ciggy butt, soaking up every little bit of toxic fume. But Mezgob, he bloody loves it. Look at the way he's holding that ciggy. He's enjoying that, he's savouring it. He's pinching onto the end of it, he's not going to waste a bit of it. This is character building. This is building character and telling you a little bit more about who Mezgob is and what he does, what he loves. Let's use a bit of our thin down orange to just glaze on the end here. Stain it up a bit where the paper becomes charred and burnt. We're going to mix a little bit of water with our Abaddon Black. Always thinning it down, always thinning our paints. This is almost like a little bit of a wash. And all we're going to do is just guide this into the gaps between where the paper ends and the ash begins. Defining the edges, aren't we? Now we're going to introduce a little bit more Rakarth flesh into our grey mix. We're just lightening it up a little bit. And we're going to add some tiny little lines, almost like little waves, gently lapping up against the beach. Except instead, this is an ashy ciggy and we're painting flaky burnt stuff. Now let's make it look even more feral. We're going to use a little bit of seraphim sepia and just dirty up this end here. If you go and Google some images of smoked ciggies, you'll see what I'm talking about. They get kind of dirty and graphic at the end of them. Part 7. Mezgob's Glowing Jaw 
Did you see that brush? That's an old brush. We're going to use an old brush for this job. Going to get some Abaddon Black on it. Rub it off on a tissue like this and just start dry brushing this pipe. We want the raised surfaces of this pipe to be black and the insides to be light. Because what we're going to do is make the inside of his jaw look like it's glowing red hot. It's going to be casting a red glow onto Mezgob's face. So what we're going to need to do is set this up. We've got to set up the glow. You can't just make it glow out of nowhere. You've got to set it up. Now we're going to use white ink here. Look at that white ink. It's basically a wash. A white wash, but it's very strong. It's very powerful. It knows exactly what it's doing. It wants to find those gaps, and it will find those gaps. And it's going to make them white. All we've got to do is just guide this ink tense white into the recesses and just stay out of its way. Let it do its thing. So this is obviously a pipe. It's not a light, but we're painting it as a light because we can. And because all glow needs to originate from some kind of light source, which in this case is the pipe. Now we also need to get some thin down ink tense white on the surfaces that are immediately around the pipe. Just get it on that surface and glaze it push it, push it towards that pipe, creating a very basic white glow. And we're not going to figure out about this little lens thing on the back of his engine. We're going to have to set that up too. Now, as we mentioned before, we don't really want to be glazing with white where possible. But for creating glow though, I think it's okay. It can get a little bit chalky. You can see it looks a little bit chalky here, but we're not worried about it. It still works. But we are going to use a little bit of duraluminium that light silver to just kind of glaze over it and blend it out a little bit. Make a bit more of a smooth transition between the dark metal colors that are in Mezgob's jaw to the lighter glowing white around that pipe. And this is the concept, of the th well the theory of creating the illusion of strong glow. You start with your white light source, make it very strong and thin that white down glaze onto the surfaces immediately around that light source, making it smooth, make it a transition, and then we add color. Now let's remove the wire from Mezgob's jaw, and we'll grab our shiv and start chipping away the super glue that's hanging out over there, so that it fits nice and snugly against the body. Because we want to be able to put the jaw onto the body and take it off again whenever we want, because we're painting the glow on his jaw and his head separately. So we need to make sure that they match. The glow matches on both parts. We're going to add our first layer of color and it's ink tense crimson. This is basically a red ink color. And inks are the best way of adding color to our glow, our OSL, because there's not much white pigment in it. They're very translucent. And we're making this into a very thin glaze. And we start glazing it onto the surface. We start coloring this piece start coloring the area around the glow and we already laid down the foundations so we already set up this glow using that white now all you have to do is color it in it's a bit hard to see what we're doing here isn't it that's because of the design of the piece here when we're painting the front the back's in the way when we're painting the back the front's in the way that's okay we won't whinge about it we'll just get it done we'll do our best we've already done our white foundation we've set up that glow all we're doing now is tinting it, glazing it very thinly and tinting it, making it go from white to red. And we just have to keep it really thin, that's all. We don't want to be going heavy on this. You'll see it. You'll see how easily this starts coming to life. Just layer it up. One layer and then another layer. Be patient. If we want it stronger, then we just let it dry, then we go again. You can see how this ink tense crimson, it's quite pink, isn't it? It's making this glow look a little bit pink. We don't really want that in this case. If we wanted a pink look, then this could work. But what we want to do is add some intensity soon. We're going to add a new color. We're going to make it hot. And that color is fluorescent red. They say it's fluorescent red on the bottle, but have a go, mate. Look at it. It looks like fluorescent orange to me. I don't know. Do they stick the wrong labels on this or something? I'm not sure, but this is what we're going with. We're not going to venture too far into the glow regions with this. This is more for the light source. This is intensifying the light source. We're glazing this into the center of this pipe, making it really hot. And this brings it to life. This is the juice that we needed to get this party going. We're keeping it very thin though, nice and thin with water. 
and just gently lay it over the over the layers that we've already done you'll see it you'll see it just liven up it'll wake up I'm going to put a tiny little bit on the glow outside but not much don't go more than a couple of mils away from the the light source a couple of mils that's all we needed now we can press it onto the body and check see how it's looking and see if it's working see what we need to adjust and the most obvious thing we need to adjust first is we need to add some glow to Mezgob's chin we're going to use some ink tense crimson for this and start glazing it onto the bottom of his chin very very subtly here we don't want to go overboard here it's very easy to go overboard with glow on a face and before you know it you've just got a bloody red face and it just doesn't look good so let's just try and keep it cool and let's keep this thin let's keep it much thinner than the iron jaw and notice that we're not setting up his face using white that's going to make his face look way too intense. We don't want that. We've already set up his face by strategically placing his highlights when we painted his skin. And each fold of skin in his face, each crease, each wrinkle, it was highlighted in a direction that faced this glow. This is premeditated glow. We knew this was going to happen. We wanted this to happen a long time ago. We thought about this glow in a dream once. So that was our preparation. That was our setting up. And we just did it when we did the skin. We don't need any white. Let's get our fluorescent red slash fluorescent orange, whatever. I think they're the same thing. But anyway, um, we're going to use that again. And very, very subtly put this on the point of his chin here. Just to warm it up a little bit. Make it a bit hotter. It's reflecting a very hot light source. So the glow, this glow, it needs to be hot too. And it's very close. But we don't want it too hot. We don't want this all over his face. Subtlety is what we want here. Sometimes less is more. Often less is more. And it's the case with glow. So now we can see how important it is these parts are separated. We can just place it on there. See how it's jiving. See how it's cooking. See how it's, the glow is reflecting onto his face. Take the parts off. And then adjust. We might need to add a little bit more intensity to this part. So we're going to use our thinned down fluorescent red and glaze over the whole thing. Whereas before we were kind of being a bit careful with it, weren't we? That's what we want though. We want to be subtle and be careful and then add more layers if we need to. That's what we're doing now. We're making sure that the fluorescent red is very, very thin and we're glazing it over his face again, just around his chin. And each one of those little highlights that we applied to his skin before Back when we were using Xandri Dust to highlight the skin, it's picking up this orange and it's intensifying it. The work that we're doing with this fluorescent orange, or fluorescent red, whatever it is, the work that we're doing with it is easy. We're not even doing anything. We're just simply changing the color of the work that we've already done. This is why it's so important that we set up the glow first. You get it set up beforehand, and then you just chill out and change colors and intensity. Check it out. What do you think of this part right here? Yeah, I reckon we should make it brighter as well. I'm glad you agree. Let's do it. We're going to make it happen with some more ink tense white. Getting it on the wet palette, pull it out, get a bit of water mixing with it. Let's start reintroducing a few white bits to the central parts of the light source, the pipe. Setting it up, resetting it up for more intensity but we definitely don't want to be going too crazy with this we want to try and keep our farm nice and calm and not get too excited just keep this white to the light source just brightening up that section that we highlighted before now instead of coloring it with intense crimson like before we're going to just go straight to fluorescent red we're going to just glaze straight over that re-established white we're skipping crimson red we don't need it, we're just going to jump the queue. We're going to make this absolutely intense here, in this one section that we highlighted earlier. This is the mothership of the light source, and it's also the closest part to Mezgob's chin, that very sharp point on his chin that's glowing really hot. Speaking of hot, I think I'm burning my fingers by touching this. Have a look at it. Yeah, that's done, that's cooked, it's burning me. Here's some tips. Find your light source paint it white 
then glaze some white around the outside and create that first step of glow you're setting the glow up then get your inks out tint the glow glaze the outer glow but be subtle about it make the light source intense but the glow subtle part eight let's make some mistakes but that's okay because we're going to fix them no one is perfect we all make mistakes with our painting that's okay we can always change our mind we can always fix things we've painted the pipes this kind of hazard stripe yellow style We've painted some of the pipes in a Rakarth flesh color as well. But we're not digging it anymore. We're going to change them soon. We decided we're going to paint this jerry can red. We're glazing it with some ink tense crimson. We don't like it one bit though. It's drawing too much attention. It's introducing an alien color that doesn't really match the rest of the model. It doesn't vibe with it. But we're just having a go. We're trying something. But anyway, let's change it. Let's fix it. Mezgob skin base. We're going to use that, mix it up on the wet palette, and paint straight over it. Straight over that jerry can. We're going to fix it up. We're going to make it a neutral color. When you can't think of what color to make something, when in doubt, just paint it a neutral color. Pick a color that's not offensive. This color, Mezgob skin base, it relates to it. It's not going to clash to anything. It's not going to steal too much attention. Let's add some Rakarth flesh to it and start introducing the highlights. Start placing the highlights and seeing where they go. Just remember how light reacts to flat surfaces. And this jerry can is made up of a bunch of flat surfaces. So let's look at each flat surface on this jerry can and imagine that the light hits the top of each surface and it goes for a little road trip and it just pops out the other side of each surface. So most of the surfaces are going to be lighter at the bottom and darker at the top. Like this surface right here, we're doing a line. We're blocking in where this highlight is, at the bottom half of the jerry can, not the top. And then we just darken up our mix, get to our little buffet of greens, and literally just paint a line between the highlight and the Mezgob green base color. And that just blurs it. That's all we do. It's so easy. If we make it thinner, we can even layer it up a little bit if we want. Further smooth out that transition. Glaze it a bit. But do you see how easy this is? You start with the base color, you add the highlight, and then it's a clear step and it's like, I'm a base and now I'm a highlight. We just blur out that line with a mid-tone. It's just so easy and so smooth. Let's add a little bit of Rekarth flesh to it and increase the highlights just around the edges here. We can add a few little scratches. Just use the edge of our brush to locate the edge of the jerry can. And it just does the finding for us. What I want you guys to take away from this is that it's fine for you guys to make mistakes. It's fine for you to accidentally paint something the wrong way or use the wrong color. But real power comes when you realize your mistakes, you become aware of your mistakes and you act on the mistakes, you fix the mistakes, use the mistakes to teach you something. Don't be a whinger. Don't be a whinge about the mistakes. Don't be scared of mistakes. Now we're painting some tiny little hairline scratches. You remember how to do it. We just paint the air and paint nothing and gradually lower that brush until it paints a tiny little kiss on the surface. We're going to use some Vallejo polished gold to highlight the ammo casings here. Scattered all over Mezgob's back, as well as the bullets here in the little Runtz 50 cal. This is a little bit of a mistake as well, but only in that I ended up deciding that I want the shells to look a little bit more corroded and messy and tarnished. This polished gold makes them look very nice and clean. Which is fine in, in any other case when you're painting bullet casings and ammo shells and things like that. For Mezgob, I want him to look really dusty and dirty and scungy. This boy's from the scrapyard. So let's just get some known oil and fix it back up. Just get it over those bullets and tarnish them back down. Problem solved. We're going to use Abaddon Black by itself just to very carefully define each bullet. There are three elements to each bullet and we want to define them all. There's the copper projectile, there's the gold ammo case, as well as the black ammo belt. We want to define each one of those three elements. Make each one sharp and clear. Now, 
Let's get right up it with part 9, the boss's zapper axe. This is a zapping, crackling power axe. It's got the electricity actually sculpted onto the model. So how are we going to paint that? What are we going to do? Let's start with some ceramite white and base coat the actual lightning bolts. Now the process here is exactly the same as how we painted the glow in Mezgob's jaw. We're going to set this up. We've got to determine where our light source is and where our main light sources are. And the lightning is definitely one of the main light sources. They're going to be one of the brightest parts on the whole axe. Let's hit it with one coat of ceramite white and then we go again. Thin it right down. We want two thin coats at least. We want a very solid coat of white. Solid but smooth. We want it pure. As though they're from the very hand of Zeus himself. Once they look like this, we're going to switch to ink tense white. Get that on the wet palette, load up our brush, and away we go. We're going to flood this into the recesses of this kind of mechanical engine part. This is the power source. This is the generator that's creating the lightning, so we want it to be as bright as the lightning. So the lightning and this part are going to kind of share the title of main light source, okay? So remember, this is the same process as creating any glow. We gotta set up our glow. We establish where our main light sources are coming from. Then we start creating some effects and some white glow. So the glow is going to be shining in between his fingers and the knuckles. This is the other side of the generator. There's possibly gonna be some light shining through this, through this turbine, this fan thing. So we're just going to run some of this white ink into it and let it do its job and find the gaps. It's just easy. Now if we go a little bit too far with our white on this turbine, and we have, we've lost a little bit of definition. All we're going to do is switch to some Abaddon Black and redefine some of the blades of the turbine, the fan. Just hit the edges, almost like we're edge highlighting, but we're using black. This is just like the pipe on the inside of Mezgob's jaw. Here we're painting a little bit of a strobe effect by glazing some Abaddon black between the windows of this little vent thing here. Next we will crack out the Duraluminium and we're gonna start finding the edges, highlighting this axe, the metallic edges of this axe. We need to locate and clearly define all of those edges that are going to be well lit by the lightning. And this is just part of the process as we set this axe up for some epic lightning glow. We want to make sure that we find not only the edges, but every little nook and scratch like this one here that's going to be well lit from that lightning. We're even going to fang out the dry brush. This is a really good dry brush. We're going to get some Duraluminium on it and wipe most of it off on a tissue and then just start dry brushing all over this axe. We're going for some easy definition here. I don't always dry brush, but sometimes I do. Sometimes I just think, bugger, I'm going to dry brush this and no one's going to stop me. But when you're dry brushing metal in particular, you get a really cool finish. You get lots of tiny little scratches and textures and visual interest that you sometimes miss out on when you're being all too good for dry brushing and being all fancy with your glazing and all that. So dry brushing definitely has its place. It even has a special place in my heart because me mum taught me how to dry brush and when your mum teaches you something, you listen to it and you never forget it. You hold on to it and you'll hold on to it forever like I have. Now we're just finishing off this edge highlighting with our fine brush. Refine those little scratches and make them sharp. I think we're ready to move on now. What do you reckon? Let's just get this wire off. Just going to grab our pliers and bloody rip it out. Again, we've got to cut off any dried super glue that's caked on there. Get a nice smooth surface. We're also going to scrape away some of the paint on this little tab that we're going to use to glue into Mezgob's arm. We'll get a stronger bond if there's no paint in it. We'll grab our Gorilla Super Glue, pop a little blob of jelly on there, in it goes, 
Fits like a glove. Well, it is a glove. Sort of a glove. Now, let's get back to the Duraluminium. Or whatever it's called. Doing exactly the same thing. But this time, we're going to highlight the fingers around the axe. And around the lightning. And that's why we needed to glue the axe to the hand. Because we're highlighting the hand now. In relation to the axe. And the lightning on the axe. And it's a bit easier to do that when... The axe is being held by the hand, and the axe isn't over there on the other side of the bloody table. Now this is the first time that we've actually highlighted this metal, isn't it? So we want to highlight it as though we were just highlighting any metal. But we also want to keep in mind the direction of the light source, that lightning, which is going to be glowing onto it. And that means that we've got to direct all of our highlights towards any of that lightning or any of the heavier light sources on the axe. Let's get to some known oil. Straight up on the wet palette. And now we're going to start enhancing some of the shadows on this axe. This is going to help highlight the highlights in a way. You know, like by creating this darkness, the lighter stuff is going to stand out more. And this is the power of contrast. But we're going to talk a lot about contrast in some later videos. But for now, we're using contrast to help sell the idea of this glowing lightning. Make people think that this is some real lightning here. By making the dark stuff seem really dark, so that the light stuff seems really light. Now, as you can see, we're creating a few little blends. A few little dark spots on the sharp parts of his axe here. But have a look at it. That's a mangled axe right there. That's all bent. He's been hitting all sorts of stuff with that. He's getting in with tanks. He's been chopping concrete walls in half. He's been splitting power armor down the middle. I don't know what, but he's been getting into it. And that blade, that axe blade has gone all wonky. Which can make it pretty hard to know where to place these highlights and, and these shades. But all we have to do is just give it a go. Just give it a crack. Pretend you know what you're doing. The best way to be brave is to pretend you're brave, and then you just pick it up and adjust. Ink Tent Cyan. Now this is a colour, mate. You want this colour. This is the colour that you need when you want to create intense blue glow. We're thinning it right down with water, as we do, and then using our tissue to control and wick away any excess water. Then all we have to do is start glazing it. Just start making it blue changing the color, tinting it. Just like before, with our iron jaw. We've already done the hard work here. We've established and we've set it up. Now all we've got to do is just change the color and tweak it. There's nothing to it. All we've got to do is keep it thin and just keep adding layers. We'll switch to a bigger brush now. So we can get it done a bit quicker slapping it all over these lightning bolts here making them blue having set it up before with that nice ceramite white on the lightning bolts this glaze just goes on easy and we can start whacking it all over the place well wherever we think there should be glow it's going to be strongest around the lightning anywhere where the lightning touches the fingers here or touches the axe blade. We need a little bit more ink tense white for this. Thinning it down of course. Wick away the water. And we're going to re-establish and intensify some of the highlights. Just like what we did with Mezgob's jaw when we wanted that pipe to be just a little bit stronger and more vibrant in that one little section. That's what we're doing here some of these parts of the metal, even bits of his skin, just pinging the edges, intensifying some of those areas to make them reflect the light strongly. Even glazing a little bit towards the lightning bolts, always towards the highlights. Push the paint, almost like you're shoveling it, but you've got to shovel it towards where you want it to go. Now back to the ink tent cyan, back to glazing. This is what we do, we go back and forth, gradually making it better, making the colors get stronger, and making the glow more and more convincing. Tricking our viewers, but not confusing them. 
and with each layer we can venture further out the more layers we add the more we can subtly expand our territory we're going to mix ceramite white with ink tan cyan about three to one remember before how we glazed over these well they looked a little bit how's it going i reckon they looked a bit patchy so we're going to paint over them with this mix make them a lot cleaner nicer and fresher more definite and as the paint starts to run out and disappear we're just going to get some dry brushing with it the paint's all gone off the brush but we're just sort of rubbing it around the place and just almost feathering it very lightly creating a little bit of a hazy glow a little bit of diffusion but we can also just touch the brush to a tiny little bit of water, fine it up, liven up that paint again, give it a twist, and then we can start getting some of these scratches here. And even though these are absolutely tiny, these all help sell the idea that there is light reflecting onto this 3D object. The light is catching those tiny scratches. Each one of those tiny scratches helps tricks the viewer into thinking this is real light. This is really glowing. And it is a trick because there is no light shining on it. It's just paint. We want to get a little bit of OSL onto the rest of the miniature, so let's just scratch up the back of his engine here. We're going to attach this to the main body. And see how we just gouge trenches into the back of it? That's going to help the part adhere to the model when we glue it later on. For now we just want to use a little bit of blue tack or some kind of sticky stuff to temporarily attach the piece to the back of the model. Rightio. How's he looking? Mate, we're feeling good about it. We're doing good. Always remember to just kick back and chill out. Remember and remind yourself that we've done a good job. Look what we've done so far. This little glowing lens on the back of his engine, that's a fun thing to paint. Remember, we already painted it white, but now we just have to glaze it with our ink tent cyan, dilute it with water. Now we're going to switch to ceramite white, and paint a little white dot in the very center of it. This is the light source. This is where the light's coming from, so we need to brighten that right up. Make it look like it's hot. Even though it's blue, it's hot. And we're going to really lightly paint some lines, some white reflections on the edges of the gauges that are immediately right next to it. Those areas are going to reflect strongly and because it's a cylinder, we're going to do a little white line along it. We know how to highlight cylinders now, don't we? Parallel lines. That's all there is to it. Back to ink tent cyan to glaze the color now. You know what we're doing now. We're going back and forth. That's how we do it. That's how we get it right. Look at the paint on that glove. That's getting some love, that glove. That's getting some work done. Back to white again. Re-establish that white central glow one last time. Part 10. Armor, rust and horns. These glyphs here, we're going to lighten them up a bit. Using Rakarth flesh. We're going to re-establish those because they got hammered in the phase of adding battle damage. A storm of battle damage, that's okay, we wanted that battle damage. But we want to make them stand out just a little bit more, so we're just going to repaint them. Not fully, we're not going to paint all the way to the edges, we're just brightening them up a bit. Making them stand out a little bit more. Make them actually visible. Switch to some ceramite white. And then we can start lightly, very lightly, highlighting the tops of them. We don't want to overdo it. We don't want to do too much work to these glyphs, and to be honest, we don't want them to stand out at all. We want them to look good, but we don't want them to be still in focus. We've got some very strong focal points on this model, and if we add more, it's just going to get confusing. So we're going to keep it subtle, and we're going to see these as secondary focal points. So always remember, when in doubt, paint it neutral. When you're not sure what color to do something, keep it neutral. Black, white, or gray or some kind of other basic color that you've got going on on the model. We're switching up to Duraluminium, and we're going to start highlighting the edges of the metal throughout the model. There's quite a lot of metal too. 
to get through. You know, this super suit isn't there. Mezgob's super suit. There's nothing to it though. All we've got to do is just edge highlight everything. You can do a little bit of dry brushing if you want, but we mostly just want to brighten up some of the silver. Now this is a little bit optional this stage. You could get away with not doing this, I reckon. But I think it looks a bit better if you do, because it defines all these little elements, like the little rivets and the little edges of the corrugated iron, things like that. It just makes everything pop out a little bit more. But the reason why you could get away with not doing it on this model is because we're going to grungy this model right up. We're going to make it really rusty and dirty later on. Make sure you at least definitely paint these bits here though, the welding scars. We want to paint them with a solid coat of dual aluminium to brighten them up. Because we're going to create a welding effect. And when you look at welds, they're very bright and clean in the center. And then on the outside, they get this kind of black scorching and strange color modulations and we're going to copy that now you can see we're doing a bit of dry brushing a bit of stippling we're doing all sorts of stuff just livening up the metal now we can switch to known oil and darken any areas down where we think we might have gone a little bit far it's easy to do that it's easy to go a little bit far sometimes that's fine though all we need to do is just take a step back and knock it back down with our darker colors when I was designing the super suit for Mezgob, it was important for me that it felt realistic and functional. You know, he's not just a walking pile of junk. I wanted him to feel like the suit actually works. So this hydraulics here, they've got proper pivot points at appropriate places where they're going to do something. He can actually move. It's got shocks on the back of his legs to soften the load of each step because he's a heavy boy. He's a big fella. He's got a full V8 engine on the back here with a jerry can full of fuel. There's a hose that connects from the bottom of that jerry can to the bottom of the engine. He's got leaking fuel everywhere. He's got stacks of exhaust pipes to carry the fumes away. Now, for some reason, we really need to switch to some ceramite white and highlight the tiny little flakes of ash on the end of his ciggy. They needed to be done. We're also blue tacking that runt onto the top. Now we're going back to our wet palette, ink tent cyan. We've got to thin this with a little bit of water, but not much. We want this to actually be strong. We're glazing this around each weld mark and create a little bit of that blue color modulation that we talked about. This strange kind of scorching that you get with some welding. You could use purple for this as well. We're going with cyan though, because it's going to match the rest of the blue that we've got on the model. We're being cautious about adding too many new colors to this model. See how we're glazing a little bit at the bases of the exhaust pipes as well, where they come out of the exhaust manifold. And we also want to do a second coat of this on all the welding lines, as well as a little bit of extra on the exhaust manifold. You'll be amazed at the power of two coats of this. It's very strong. We decided to make the Medal of Honor blue as well, but we're quickly realizing that that's a mistake and we don't want to be doing that. It's drawing way too much attention and it's clashing a little bit. We're going to change it soon. But first, let's get some Vallejo metal medium and highlight the inside of each welding scar. This is amazing, this paint. This is basically like metallic white. It's pearl white. It's one of the brightest metallic colors that you can get. And it's just great for highlighting the welding scars and making them very shiny. Dark rust. Let's fix up that Medal of Honor ribbon that we painted blue. We're just painting over it. It was just clashing a little bit, don't you think? And we're just going to make it neutral. Mix some Rakarth flesh with it and reapply the highlights. We've done it before, so we'll do it again. We'll treat that little knot there like a cylinder and we'll treat this area here like a flat surface. So highlight towards the bottom of it and make a gradient that goes towards the bottom of those highlights. And with that cylinder, we'll just have kind of like a shiny line. Mix up our library of colors to select from. We've got a mid-tone now. Start blurring out those highlights in much the same way that we've been highlighting other things on the model, the jerry can, the skin, the pants, the black stuff. 
using our buffet of colors to select and find exactly the right color. Enhance the highlights, enhance the shadows. Expand out those midtones. To finish off, we're going to use some known oil just to enhance the shadows a bit more. Darken them down and make them look even more shiny. Now we have a nice neutral Medal of Honor. We're going to switch to an old brush now, a dry brush. Get some dark rust and just start dry brushing and stippling. We're going to start the process of darkening and dirtying up the armor, making it look rusty. Appropriate dark rust for things like exhaust, where you want that really dark rust color. That kind of manifold muffler type rust, you know. Get it on your brush. Start stippling everywhere. Let's focus it on the exhausts, the openings of the exhausts in particular. Make them, make them very brown. That turbine, see how we've darkened that right down, made it nice and dirty with that Vallejo dark rust. Now, all the edges that we've highlighted before with Dura Aluminium, let's just YOLO all that and get this everywhere. While we've got the dark rust out, let's get some water with it and make a little bit of a wash and apply this wash here and there. Let it, let it kind of sink in around the rivets and around the details, the edges here. Remember, we're YOLOing these nice shiny edges. We're doing that for a reason though. We're doing it for two reasons. Number one, because we want his armor to be very rusty. Number two, when you calm down the edges and you soften them or darken them down, what you're doing is you're giving the viewers eyes a rest. You're creating areas of rest versus areas of detail. And this is contrast, detail versus rest. And if everything was just detail, 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 the viewer's eyes just don't know where to look. It's all too confusing for them. It's all too hectic. Everything's too chaotic. We don't know where to look. But by calming things down, we're telling the viewer, look over there. Look at that shiny thing. Now let's get some of this dark rust all over the bottom of his axe. Because it's always hanging out in the mud in that, isn't it? That's how you want to think when you apply rust. You want to think like rust. You want to be like, if I was a dirty little piece of rust, where would I be? Where would I hide? I'd be hiding behind some of these rivets, that's for sure. So let's get some of this thinned down brown wash all over the rivets. So we've dry brushed, we've stippled, and we've made dirty little dark rust washes. We've got a good foundation for our rust, but let's enhance it now. We're going to use riser rust, we're going to get it on the wet palette, and look what we're going to do to it. We're going to mix heaps of water with it and turn it into another rust wash. Now this is a dry brush paint, but we're not going to dry brush with it. We're going to be making a wash with it. Look what we're doing. Just gently letting it go wherever it wants. Just touch the brush to the model and let that rust flow forth. Now it's fine to use water when you're making a rust wash. You don't need to use medium. You want it to have that kind of ugly inconsistency and tide marks and all that. You want it infecting the metal. And we want the wash to be really thin so we can go super heavy on these textured areas like the diamond plate, the checkered plate. I know it looks like it's pretty heavy, but when it dries, it's going to thin right out and look pretty cool. Now, because we've thinned this into a wash, the rust is acting the way it's supposed to. But if we were to use it like a dry brush paint, like it says on the bottle, I think we'll get the effect that we want. And the effect that we want is to make it look like Mezgob has just got some runt to go through the junkyard and find some plates of metal and bits of junk. It's all rusted, of course it's rusted, but it's perfect for a boss's armor because it's big and it's heavy and it's tough and it's going to go clink and bang and smack when bullets bounce off it. It's going to go stomp when Mezgob walks around, so his boys are going to love it. And best of all, it was free because some runt found it in a scrap pile. So that's why we're mashing rust onto it. Now remember, we're thinking like rust. Where are we going? We're getting in the ditches, we're hiding in the rivets, we're hiding in the dents of the armor and the cracks. And when we're finished our first pass, let's go around and do it again. Double up that rust. Watch how it gets heavy when you add two coats to it. Indulge yourself now, have fun with it. Put as much rust as you want. Let's get our Abaddon Blackout 
I reckon it's time to finally start painting over these pipes that we've talked about. There's nothing wrong with them. We've just decided that we had enough colours going on. We don't need more. We don't need any yellow. We're just going to calm our farm right down and make them black. We'll paint them the same way as how we painted all the other black stuff. Just with Abaddon black mixed with some Rakarth flesh. Bring it up to a nice shiny highlight. Nice and easy. We'll get that done and then we can move on. Let's mix up our own brown wash now using Lamian medium and dark rust, about 4 to 1. Now remember, a good substitute for dark rust would be Rhinox Hired or Dryad Bark. Either of those will get it done. But let's mix up a bit of a wash using medium this time. We're going to paint the horns. We've held off painting the horns for this whole time. And we've done that because... If we had painted them at the start, half the paint would have probably rubbed off by now. Because the horns stick out so far from the main body, they've been in contact with my hands this whole time. My hands have been sort of resting on them, using as a support. So we want to just wait until right at the end before we paint the horns. We can even get some of this brown wash on the spent ammo casings here, just tarnishing them up a little bit. While we're waiting for those horns to dry, Let's get some straight up dark rust, not the wash version, but just straight dark rust and start hitting the raised areas of the checker plate, the diamond plate. Using a darker color to highlight, which is a strange concept you might think, but it's actually really effective. Makes the checker plate, makes it really stand out against that rust. So be open to using darker colors to hit the raised areas sometimes. We don't always have to be highlighting with a lighter color, like the books say. Observe nature, and observe what's going on around you, and you'll see it. Sometimes things are darker on the tops than they are on the bottom. That's just the way it is sometimes. Now that the brown wash on the horns is dry, let's use dark rust, but this time thin it with water. We're finished with the wash. We're going to be doing some glazing now. When we glaze, we load up the brush, we touch the brush to the tissue, and wick away the water. And then we start glazing these horns. We want to glaze towards the tips of the horns, never towards the base. We want the horns to be darker at the tips and lighter at the base. So for this first layer, let's just paint about 70% of each horn. The 70% that's closer towards the tip, obviously. And that 30% of the base, we'll just leave that alone. Once that's dry, we're going to go again, but this time we're painting about 40 to 50% of each horn. So we've done 70%, now we're doing about 40 or 50%. We could go again, go 30%, then 20%, then 10%, and just gradually edge closer and closer towards the tip. And the more layers you do, the smoother it's going to look, but the longer it will take. You got to find that balance, how long you want to take it versus how smooth you want it. Now let's continue it, but this time we're going to switch to Abaddon Black as we edge right towards the tip, thinning it down with water. We want to really make that tip nice and dark. Just keep going until we're happy with it, until it's dark enough. Now, if you want, you could reverse this. You could make it darker at the base and lighter at the tip. It's up to you. But it's a personal preference, and I like to make it darker at the tip because it's less distracting. Our eyes are naturally drawn to the thing that is lightest, so if we've got a whole bunch of light things poking out from the model, it can be a bit distracting and confusing, can't it? Once we're happy with that black, we need to find some of the scratches and the dents that we've got here. We've got some holes, we've got some full-on gouges in those horns. While we've got it out, let's quickly just darken up this Medal of Honor. Enhance it even more. Make it look like it's shiny and almost satin. We can do this sometimes, we can sort of just move around the model and find different areas while we've got a certain colour out, even if we thought we'd finished it. Like right now, we're just tarnishing up the springs. Back to the horns and we can add a little bit of shadow on the underside of each horn. They're big horns, so they're going to make a bit of a shadow. Just place a little bit of darkness under it and away we go. We're going to do one more pass on the horns here, make them a little bit darker. And then we're going to move on to the next stage of the horns, which will be highlighting them. Adding definition. But 
For now we just need to finish up these horns and make them super dark on the tips. Then we can make up our little mix using Xantru Dust and Steel Legion Drab. About one to one. We're just going to start highlighting these horns. They've got a lot of cracks and a lot of holes and a lot of ridges so it's quite easy to find where we need to put the highlights. But we're going to make sure that we don't venture much further than about 50% of the horn with this colour. We don't want to be infecting all of that darkness that we just finished glazing. We only want to highlight from about the midpoint towards the base now. We're just going to leave those dark tips alone. The only bits we might highlight in the dark areas are just the very sharp scratches and the gouges. See how we can just add a little bit of interest rather than just painting the ridges by painting a straight line. As we drag the brush along them, we can sort of jitter our brush around and create a little bit of randomness and texture. A little bit more interest as opposed to just painting a solid straight line. We're going to use Xandry Dust just by itself now as we get closer towards that end of the base. We don't want to go anywhere near 50% up the horn now, we want to stay sort of closer towards 25% of the base. Except any holes like this one here, that's okay. We can allow ourselves to highlight those just a tiny bit, just a tiny bit. We want to be really subtle about those. You can see what we're doing though, we're trying to enhance the highlights towards the base of each horn and leave that dark tip alone, wherever possible. And you can see why. Have a look at how effective the finished horns look. Having that light base just draws your attention straight towards the center of the model. Now as we know on Mezgob, he's got a big zap axe casting all that blue lightning. We've already painted that, but we're not finished. We just need to get some more ink tent cyan, thin it down and continue creating that OSL and enhancing it. Because all of that crackling lightning will be casting a lot of light across the rest of the miniature not just on the immediate surroundings around the lightning, it'll be casting blue light all over this side of the model, all over his arm, all over his little runt, all over the backpack, all over his jerry can, and in real life it would be casting a lot life than what we're going to do, but I reckon that's a bit overkill for a miniature. OSL in this kind of glow effect always looks, this, always looks better when you're more subtle with it. So what we want to do is just gently tint everything, trick the viewer into thinking that that crackling lightning is changing the color properties of each of these elements. It's making this green arm turn a little bit blue. It's this hydraulic here, it's reflecting blue light and this little runt up here, he's in the glow of that blue lightning as well. And while we're at it, we can even enhance the glow on the axe, constantly adjusting because what happens over here affects what happens over there on the runt and the boss's arm. So never stop adjusting until it looks just right. Let's do something special now. We're going to make old Mezgob's eye glowing, almost like he's got some kind of connection to his axe. We're going to use ink tense white and just flood the eye socket as well as this scar on his head with this nice beautiful white. Get it set up for a mad blue glow. Let's also whack a little bit of this white on the metal collar around his head. We're going to let his blue light cast some light on this part of the armor. Almost like a bit of a lens flare. We want to be really subtle with it though. We're only putting white on the very tips, the very pings, facing towards the blue eye. While we've got the white out, we can add a few little tiny pings to the tips of his teeth here as well as a little dot on each one of these little tiny bumps on his lips. And we're going to add one more final little white dot on his red eye. We did that before but we're just refining it and making it a little bit nicer. Okay let's make his left eye blue. Ink tense cyan, that's what we need. Thin down with a little bit of water like usual. And we're just going to glaze it, just like we've done, with all the other OSL on here. Just glaze it around the area. Now, Mezgob's actually based on me. He's based on Mezgike. 
because he's got a bung eye. His left eye is buggered, just like mine. And over the past year or so, my left eye, it's just sort of wandered off. It's gone walkabout, it can't be bothered anymore. I can't see much at all with it anymore. I got told that I got a degenerating eye disease. And, you know, that's life, isn't it? Life gives you challenges. I'm not going to whinge about it, though. I'll count myself lucky because I've got a spare eye. My right eye. My right eye is freaking awesome. It sees everything I need it to see. And I'm only telling you this because I just hope that it can inspire you to to not let challenges get in your way of anything that you want to do. I'm not going to let some bloody eye disease stop me from painting. That's for damn sure. We'll just find a way to deal with it and get on with it. Anyway, we've done our blue glaze. Now we just need to get a bit of ceramite white and pop out some of these edges. Now Mezgob's bung eye is done, and he's not going to let it get in the way of his plans, is he? I'm going to show you some magic now. This is burnt sienna dried pigment from Vallejo. This is some top quality stuff here. This is game changing stuff. We're going to finish up the rust now. We're using this straight out of the bottle. We're going to stipple this all over the rust and all over the armor. Well, not all over. We're going to be we're going to be selective. We're not going to go silly with it, but just stipple it over the rust and enhance the rust. Make it look crusty. It gives another texture and another dimension. It makes the rust look rough, but it can also make it look smooth at the same time because you can enhance your blends just by stippling. Like, look at this bit here. His arm bracer. Look how easy it is to just create some nice blends with it. Pile it on around the river and then just gradually feather it out by stippling poking it around and moving it around until it looks like a bit of a blend it's so easy it gives such richness to the miniature we need to make sure that we wait until the end before applying these bit dry pigments though because we need to seal them and if we do this at the start it's just going to rub off whenever we touch it that is the drum and it means it's part 11 Let's paint the base. Then we can carry on with our lives. Steel Legion Drab, that's what we need. We're going to thin it right down. More so than you normally would. We're just going to smash it all over the base. Well, all of the textured parts of the base. We're only doing one coat so that it looks like that. Because we want some of that black to shine through. We want some of the black on the peaks to create a little bit of interest and variation among the dirt and the rocks. Make it look like there are brown rocks and there are also some black rocks scattered among it. Then we hit up some Xandri dust and start dry brushing it. I love dry brushing bases. Look at that miniatures holder. Look how smooth it rotates and how relaxing it is to just dry brush this base as it rotates around. That's it, that's the sand done, that's how easy it is. See the black shining through? That's what I mean. It creates a little bit of visual interest and a little bit of variation. Now it's time to paint the mushrooms. We're going to start with Ceramite White. Let's hit them up with a nice white base coat. We're going to do two coats of this. After we've done our first coat, we're going to thin that white down and start glazing around the outside. Start setting up our glow. That's what we do. We paint our light source. And then we start glazing around the outside, setting up the glow. Because we're going to make these mushrooms glowing blue. We want glowing blue mushrooms because we've got a glowing blue zap axe. We've got a glowing blue bung eye. We need a third thing. Creating a trifecta of awesome glowing blue stuff. And that's the mushrooms. This means there's going to be three focal points. Three things drawing our attention. And that creates a triangle shape, which is the power shape. And our eyes find that shape really appealing to look at because of some kind of eye science I'd say. Now we've set up our glowing mushrooms while that's drying we're going to get some blighted gold and re-establish these spent ammo casings which got absolutely hammered in the dry brushing storm. Same with these little nuts down here. Let's give them back some riser rust which we took from them when we dry brushed. And then after that, we're going to get our little dry brush and start dry brushing some ceramite white around the mushrooms. And this is just another way we can set up our glow, dry brushing. There's nothing wrong with it. It works really well. 
Now we'll use some ink tint cyan to start tinting the mushrooms. Glaze around them. This is now the third or fourth time that we've done this on the miniature now, so we're experts now. We just need to remember to keep our paints very thin, be patient, and layer up. Let the inks do their work. Let them tint the color. Let them change the hue. That's what they're for. That's what they do. They tint. Don't be getting impatient and trying to cheat. Don't try and skip the thinning down. The thinning down with water is very important. It's all about layers. You can't do this in one go. It's not going to look good. Back to ceramite white. Hit the peaks of the mushrooms. And then we're going to start brightening them up. Because remember that these are the light source. The mushrooms themselves, the areas around the mushrooms, aren't going to be as bright as the light source. So we want the very peaks of the mushrooms to be white, as well as the rims. And the kind of curved area in between the peak and the rim, we're going to blend that and smooth that out by mixing some ceramite white with ink tent cyan, about three to one. We're going to mix up this color and just sort of paint in between the in-between colors to make a nice smooth transition. We don't want it to go from light to dark too quickly. We want it to be very smooth, a very short range. That's what you want with a light source. You don't want any kind of harsh shadows inside the mushrooms. That would break the illusion that these mushrooms are a light source. It's also very important to highlight the areas around the mushrooms. Objects that are very prominent, like the orc skull, this rock that's very close. Things that are immediately close are going to be very reflective of this light. And those tiny little details, they help sell the illusion of the glow. Just like on that axe before, adding tiny little scratches to the axe. Use those things to your advantage, those tiny little things that help sell our trick, our illusion, that these are glowing mushrooms, that these are real and this is real light and not just a bunch of blue and white paint. Speaking of blue paint, let's get some more Inktense Cyan. Just keep going back and forth, adding more highlights, and then going back to our glaze, enhancing it constantly back and forth, adjusting everything. What we also want to do is we want to make the shadows like under this skull here. We want that to be blue. We want to tint it blue. There's a little bit of shadow under the mushrooms. Now I know that mushrooms are a light source and they wouldn't be casting a shadow under them. But you gotta remember this isn't real light. This is a plastic miniature. The fact is that there will be a shadow under it and we need to make it blue. We're even painting tiny little blue shadows behind these tiny bits of sand and rock. And these are the details that are selling it for us. Back to ceramite white for a tiny bit of dry brushing. A little bit of diffusion. Let's rekindle our friendship with dry brushing. It's our friend. We can use it. Let's get some Zandri dust and dry brush that. This is going to help feather the glow. We're only doing this on the exterior parts of the glow. Just blurring the area where the glow fades away into the sand. Smoothing it. And that's the work of dry brushing. A great tool for feathering. Now we're going to use a little bit of known oil. We're almost finished now. We're just creating a few more shadows around each one of these spent ammo casings. And we're going to put a little bit on some of the rocks and this big rock here, because we want to create a little bit more depth around the outside of the glow. So again, this is contrast. This is making the rock seem darker on one side so that it enhances the lightness of the glowing mushrooms on the other side. I think this is the last tweak of ceramite white on those mushrooms, just highlighting the outside of them, just making them ping just a little bit more, enhancing the brightness one last time. And then I reckon we should give ourselves a pat on the back. We've done an awesome job. We've even rekindled a long lost friendship with dry brushing. Now let's use Abaddon Black to paint the base room. Thin very lightly with some water. Not too runny, not too thick, just right. And we're just going to lovingly paint this base room. Sensually. 
always keep your base rims nice and clean. Don't be spilling glue and stuff all over them. You want a nice smooth finish. And then our main parts are complete. We need to give them a nice smooth coat of matte varnish and this is what I use, Vallejo matte varnish. And once that's done, we can gloss up some areas like the dripping oil on the back of the engine. We want that to be shiny, we don't want that to be matte. We'll just give it a nice coat or two with some gloss. There's some spats up here on top of Mezgob's armor on his lid. We want those to be nice and wet looking. Now we can clip the parts off the wires and assemble this miniature using our Gorilla Super Glue. Put a few little blobs of jelly on the soles of his feet and gently press him into the base. And he should fit perfectly because we made footprints on that sand, didn't we? We can glue his belly plate on, which is a nice, satisfying fit. Because we've made sure to chip away any dried bits of super glue before gluing any of these parts together. Once he's all finished and assembled, we're going to do a once over. He's been varnished, but that's okay. We can give ourselves the luxury of popping out a few details, highlighting a few areas and cleaning up a few bits. Like these scratches on his axe here. Those are his notches. He's got a few notches, doesn't he? Those are all the bosses that he's smacked. We're highlighting these, but we're also adding new scratches. Ink tense cyan. We've got to glaze a little bit of glow onto his boot. Because now that it's assembled, we can see that there needs to be a little bit of glow on that part from those mushrooms. Using Ceramite White, we can just work our way around the model and add a few little extra shines, a few little pings, if we feel that it needs it. Like here on his ribbon, and on some of the other black areas, like this little runt's boot here. Just shine some of them up. Now this is optional, but if we want our base to look like it's a little bit wet, like it's been raining or it's a bit muddy or something, we can lightly dry brush a little bit of thinned down gloss like Ardcoat or something like that. It just gives it a little bit more interest and a little bit more texture. And this really is the touch-up phase, isn't it? When the model is fully assembled like this, it's on the base, it's pretty much finished. And that sometimes highlights areas that aren't quite finished or they're a little bit lacking or they're not pushing the boundaries enough. So that's when we make our last stand. This is our final chance to get things just the way we want them. Now this has been the miniature for the Mezgeik Patreon during the month of April 2022. If you're watching this and it's not that month, that means that Mezgob isn't available on the Patreon anymore. But not to worry, you can always get him from the website, mezgeik.com. Now get ready for this crazy journey that we're about to go on together, because every single month I'm making brand new miniatures for you and giving you videos on how to paint them. Hell yeah. And as we approach the final brush stroke for Mezgob, I want to leave you guys with one more thing to think about, and that's self-doubt. I don't want any one of you doubting yourselves. You're all legends. You're all bloody capable of anything. If I can do this with a bung eye, mate, you can do this. Anybody can do this. You just have to believe you can do it. Start with a belief and everything else will follow. <laughs>